Okay, thank you. Um, any declaration of conflict given the, the agenda we put together? Yeah, Ms. Yes, Yes, I'd like to recuse myself from uh, PIR discussion. Okay, thank you, Mr. John, can you capture that? Done, okay, perfect, thank you. Any other conflict? Okay, good. Moving on to the actual agenda, um, we approved actually um, the new rules for e-voting like, you know, last time. And uh, that has given us, you know, great flexibility because now we can approve things um, in a faster way. So we have a, a bunch of resolutions here that we approve it by e-vote. So we need to basically, well, document them. Um, John. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's 11 resolutions. They're in the agenda. You've already, all the trustees have already voted in favor of them. So presumably you know what they say. And I will agree with Gonzalo that not having to do these 11 things in person gives us a lot of more, a lot more time to do real work. Okay, perfect. Um, Ted. Uh, as an observer, I, I'm somewhat surprised by the resolution that appoints Kathy Brown to the executive committee. At the, we passed that last summer at the time. It was, I still, see. it was still correct. And Kevin and I scratched our heads and decided that since we appointed her in her role as CEO, she magically has transmuted into, into Andrew for the, re, for the rest of the, of the committee's term. Thank you for explaining. Any, any other question? I mean, this, this is not like passing the resolution, it's documenting them. That's why sometimes they are a bit late. Um, when we believe that, that they should be documented right away, we, we uh, yeah, but this one basically, yeah, fell through the cracks. So that, that's the reason. But thanks for paying attention, Ted. <laughs> um, okay, so the next one, we have a consent agenda, which are things basically that we agreed to too, but we haven't e-voted on them or we haven't approved them yet. So um, moving on to point number three, Kevin. So do you want to introduce that, John? Is the consent agenda? agenda? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the two items on the consent agenda are things that we've already discussed by email. The first one is um, to amend the nominations committee charter. And the second one is to appoint a member of the trust since the trust a couple of days ago changed its rules to allow us to appoint somebody directly. Um, so the two and the, the two resolutions are in your agenda. Again, the, the trustees have all, have all discussed them. So I would propose a vote by show of hands. Okay, before we make the motion, any comment? I'll give trustees 10 seconds to Okay, good. So we need someone to move. Aris moves, um, as Peter seconds. So we're gonna pass the resolution as John proposed by a show of hands. So everybody, we're gonna vote yes, no, and abstain as usual. Um, trustees voting yes, please raise your hands. Trustees voting no. Any abstentions? Yeah, so Kevin, did Hiroshi, Say something. Uh, he had to drop off. Okay, so so we have Pepper is not here. Hiroshi is not here. Otherwise, everyone else voted yes. So the resolution passes. And um, by the way, we can inform the ITF leadership we have here that we have appointed John Levin to the to the ITF trust for two years, right? Yeah, for two years. Um, okay, and then um, moving on to point number four in the agenda, we would like to welcome the rejuvenated chapter and the Colombian chapter. So we have a, hold on a second, here, the resolution to, to welcome them. Um, John, you want to read that or I can't do that. Okay, so the resolution says that it's resolved that the ISOC Board of Trustees warmly welcomes the rejuvenated Colombian chapter to the Internet Society. Um, I suggest we pass the resolution by acclamation. Good. So we caught up and now we are five minutes ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, okay, so now, as I said before, we're going to receive some reports from the ITEC community. So we are very happy to have, you know, the chairs of the, you know, ITF um, LLC, IAB, and the uh, ITF chair. Um, so we have Alisa, Ted, and, and Glenn. Um, thanks for, for coming. Um, so I guess we're going to start with Glenn, then Ted, and Alisa. Um, and roughly, I mean, you have 
a one hour envelope, you want me to kind of let you know at the 20 minute mark or you want to handle the time yourselves or? I, I'm fine on my own. I think I probably have 10 minutes worth of stuff, so. Okay, good. So please go ahead. So thank you. Um, Kevin, next slide, please. So I, I don't think it comes as any surprise that the ITF has restructured itself away from uh, what it had been and turned into now the ITF Administration LLC, which is a terrible name, by the way, and we know it. Um, <laughs> um, that took place uh, through the end. So this, this is the background of why we did it. Uh, you know, we, we had a lot of um, experience over the last 10 years as, after the original IASA structuring that the ITF put together. Uh, we had a great working relationship with ISOC, but there was some straining places in, in our ability to operate. Um, and so after a lot of discussion, uh, it was eventually concluded that the best way to do it would be to give the IETF a little more independence um, in order, it's, especially around financials, and its ability to sign contracts and operate for itself. Next slide, please. So. It happened. On August 27th, the papers were signed and filed in Delaware. So we are now a Delaware um, LLC. Uh, we are, uh, in terms of ISOC, we are a disregard entity. Uh, our uh, financials will ultimately roll up for tax purposes up through ISOC, um, but we are um, able to operate and have our own bank accounts and, and sign contracts, as I said. So it's a good relationship. Next slide, please. So, uh, how does this all actually work? Uh, so, uh, the LLC is a disorder entity of ISOC and, and it's a member organization. So, ISOC is the sole member of the organization. ISOC has decided that, uh, as part of our agreement, that the day to day operations will be overseen by a board of five directors. Uh, those five directors are made up of uh, three are selected by the IETF NOMCOM, one is appointed by ISOC, and one is selected by the IESG. And the process right now is ongoing uh, to select those people. I th you, you've already selected Sean to be your appointee. Um, the ISG, I guess, will wait till the NOMCOM is fi finished restructuring the ISG and make whatever decision they want to make. But that's their business. And the NOMCOM is underway right now, selecting um, three nominees. Uh, they have a slate of 17. And the, right now, they're soliciting uh, feedback on those nominees, the 17 nominees. Uh, so in the interim, what we did is created the interim board. Uh, and we decided to pick. Uh, the chairs of the ISOC, Board of Trustees, uh, the IOC, uh, the IAB, and the ISG. Uh, one, one, one thing I learned from that is, you know, they said, well, you're, you're the guy whose committee is going away, so you get to be chair. Um, picking people that are very, very busy and then saying to them, now you have to sit down and do a lot of board work has made uh, scheduling meetings on my part very, very challenging uh, with all these very busy people. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, part of this, this restructuring too, it, it's a cultural change. So the IOC in the past was very hands-on in many ways, and, and, and a lot of people thought that, that wasn't the appropriate level for the volunteers to be engaging in. Um, and so uh, as part of this restructuring, there's this new position called the IETF Executive Director. And while Portia, who has been serving as the interim uh, IAD, doing a very similar work over at IETF, uh, has now taken on the role of interim IETF executive director, the, the new position is actually a bigger role than it had been for the IED. Because they are, now the idea is that the board will be an executive oversight. They will worry about strategic budgeting. They will worry about strategic uh, direction for the LLC. But they will not get involved in the micromanagement and the micro doing that the IOC had been guilty of at some times in the past. And so there's a real cultural change going on here. Um, so Portia will be serving as the interim uh, IETF executive director. Uh, and when the full board is seated at ITF 104, the plan is then that they will put out an executive search operation and go find a, a, a permanent um, ITF executive director for that role. Uh, the other little glitch we had was, you know, part of the changeover was to get rid of the IOC, which in the past had done the, you know, the, the administrative operations for the ITF. When we got into the weeds of this, and it turns out there was a small glitch, which was that the ITF trust uh, the requirement to be a trustee requires you to be a member of the IOC. And we then realized if we had sunset the IOC, the IETF trust would have no eligible members. And so the next exercise was to go off and update all the trust agreements, which has now been done. Uh, and we were able to hold a trust meeting this week, uh, approve the, the changes, and uh, the ISG did their, their approvals. And so now we were able to actually shut down the IOC 
and still have ITF uh, trustees. And so that's now been done. Uh, and the new process for selecting trustees is uh, one will be appointed by ISOC, one will be appointed by ISG, and three will be appointed by the ITF NOMCOM, which is currently open and looking for candidates. They have two, they need three. So if you're looking for some extra work, here's your opportunity. <laughs> It's also very mellow yeah. compared to other John, operations. John, John had a point. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a small amount of extra. So, okay, next slide, please. So what are we doing? What's changed? Well, the IOC, uh, we shut it down the other night officially. We, we gave everybody their plaque. We got a, everybody got photographed. And so uh, the IOC is dead. Long live the IOC. Um, to do that, we, of course, had to change the trustee agreements. And we also had to also start moving um, the work from the IOC, things like meeting venue selection, budget preparation, uh, that has all been now done. And so we were able to actually close the darn thing down. Um, the other big follow in that is after we closed the IOC and assumed its work, uh, one of the biggest things is the contracts. So, you know, traditionally or historically, the ITF could not sign contracts. It couldn't enter into its own con any contracts. ISOC did that for, on behalf of the I ITF. Now that we're an entity, uh, we have a legal team that's going through each of the contracts and the language of them and doing a reassignment exercise. And so it isn't simply, you know, flip it over. Sometimes the contracts have specific language that may have to be renegotiated or changed or updated to reflect the change that it's going to move to the ITF LLC. Next slide. And oh, and the target for that to get done is we're trying to get done by year end. But we'll see. So uh, where we're at right now, board selection is underway. The goal is to seat them by ITF 104 next March. Uh, the, the overall philosophy of the current board is to keep the lights on, not make huge uh, decisions that we don't have to make. Uh, just, you know, have things prepared and get it on the right path. When the full board is seated, they can start taking over and doing the hard work. To that end, one of the things we had to do was uh, complete the ITF 2019 budget ahead of the full board. And that was an interesting exercise because uh, a couple of things that come out of that. One, we had to anticipate what the board might want to do and put in the funding into that budget to give them the freedom to do it because we don't want them to have to come next March in the very first order of business is to restate the budget. Uh, and the other part, of course, is in which you guys, I guess, will take a look at later uh, this weekend uh, is the uh, ISOC's contribution to our reserve fund which is where ITF is getting the core of its initial reserve from. There's a calculation that it's dependent on our budget and then a number pops out in the end. Uh, the bank accounts, we, we have a now a bank account, we've opened, we're like becoming like real grown-ups. Um, and the other part of the course is, you know, with this reserve contribution, we also have some um, investment uh, money. Just like ISOC has uh, your investment requirements, we have to take that money and invest it somehow. And so one of the other operations uh, discussions we have to have uh, when we meet in a couple of weeks as a board is to do the initial setup of that and get it prepared so that when ISOC is ready to transfer the money, there's a place for it to go in the operational uh, strat strategy for managing that money until the full board is set. And uh, the last thing is, of course, the contracts are being reviewed and, and reassigned. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Glenn. Um, any questions to Glenn? I think that was a very good summary of where we are, actually. Thank, thank you, Gonzalo, the fellow board member. <laughs> a little soul there. Yeah, true. You have the whole board here. It's the four of us now. John. Uh, I, I have a, a question. Um, we contemplated moving over the IETF trust, which, but which, which due to the sort of the unfortunate way it's worded might be difficult. Have you given any thought to that yet? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's fine where it is indefinitely, so it's not like it's a big, big issue. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. Um, so moving on to Ted. You can skip this slide. Uh, so this slide is uh, one you've seen many times before if you've been on the board or been an observer at board meetings. Um, it's a description of how the IAB relates to ISOC. And it's a reminder to the community that uh, in addition to being part of the IETF, 
uh, where it helps uh, the standards process as an appeals chain uh, and helps the ITF relate to the wider world. We're also here to serve you as a source of advice or uh, technical guidance if you should need it. Um, we do that in part um, by issuing statements to the rest of the world um, and in, in, in part in, in direct collaboration with uh, ISOC staff. Um, there's a, a liaison from the ISOC board um, to uh, the IAB and one of the paths of uh, communications through that liaison. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so since the last time uh, we presented a, re a report to the board, uh, there has been a significant change in our process. Um, after the last ITF, there were requests to the IB to make its agendas and its board meetings uh, public and more transparent. Uh, this was in part because the community was surprised about uh, the appearance of a, a meeting which was turned to buff around the evolution of the RFC editor series. Um, it was something where a number of the different streams that produce RFCs had become concerned uh, that there wasn't enough flexibility and perhaps uh, experimenting with new uh, output formats would be a good idea. Uh, and so we brought that to the community. Um, given the timing of that, there wasn't a lot of time for the community to process it. And they they requested that the IED in future make its agendas and its its meetings open to the public uh, to, to allow people who wanted to follow a particular piece of work, for example, the RFC editor series and its oversight uh, to, to look at the agendas and decide whether they wanted to attend the meeting as an observer. Uh, so the IEB uh, worked out some logistics for that and it is now done. Uh, the links you have in these uh, are both to uh, the agendas themselves and to a, a calendar entry which allows you to, to follow a calendar which will tell you what the uh, uh, different uh, agendas are for any particular week. Um, there is still a carve out here uh, as you'll see in the next slide. Uh, a good bit what, of what the IAB does is to focus on uh, liaison relationships and there are a number of appointments which are made for those and as personnel issues, those need to happen in executive session. Uh, so there are still executive sessions for the IAB uh, which are not available uh, to observers, uh, but they typically happen at the end of a meeting so that we have the public portion first and then go into executive session. Uh, the other things that have uh, occurred as recent activity, uh, two of the long awaited workshop reports have occurred. RFC 8477 was published as the results of the Internet of Things Semantic Interoperability Workshop. Uh, RFC 8462 is a report from the Managing Radio Networks in an Encrypted World Workshop. And these are hideously and inappropriately late. Um, they're both over two years after the workshop was actually held. And so the IAB is looking very hard to, to see if possibly we should adopt some different working methods on producing these workshop reports so that they can appear in a far more timely fashion. Um, in particular, we're, we're looking at trying to make sure that the original uh, web presence for a workshop, which contains uh, the collection of the people who are attending, uh, the call for papers, and often the papers uh, which were submitted for consideration, uh, could be the venue of, by which we hope that we host the workshop report uh, itself. Uh, so we're trying to combine those two. Uh, and there's a call out to, to the internet community, both uh, in the IETF and IRTF, uh, for comment on this um, as part of the, the transparency we were talking about before. One of the other pieces of recent activity were IEB comments on the Australian Assistance and Access Bill. It is fairly rare for the IEB to make a direct comment on a piece of legislation. Uh, we occasionally respond to requests for comments uh, from uh, governments on uh, different parts of the internet ecosystem. Uh, but this was one that was brought to our attention by two of our members who happen to be Australian and who uh, raised quite serious concerns that if, um, if it continued uh, along its current path, uh, there was quite a risk of fragmentation and certainly a risk uh, that the trust infrastructure on which the upper layers of the internet rely uh, would be severely compromised or damaged. Um, so we did decide uh, to take the unusual step of making comments, which we then repeated in a later stage of the, of the process. Um, our, our preference in cases like this is to make a general statement and then to draw the attention of uh, particular governments to the general statement. And we're still in the process of working out whether there is a general statement to be made here. Um, it's a little difficult because the contextualization is pretty specific to the proposals uh, made by the Australian government. 
Um, uh, but uh, the two folks who were uh, most involved in, uh, in drafting that, uh, Martin Thompson and Mark Nottingham, are still looking at whether it's possible to make a general statement uh, for the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the, one of the things the, um, the ID does is make appointments. Uh, uh, a couple of those that were uh, recently uh, done, Tim Wazinski was appointed to the CCG, uh, which advises the IETF Trust. Uh, this is a body that was created during the IANA transition uh, to allow uh, the other parts of the, the ICANN uh, uh, ecosystem to have a voice uh, in speaking to the IETF Trust when the IANA IPR was transferred to the Trust. Uh, Ole Jacobson was reappointed to the ICANN NOMCOM, and we refreshed the membership of the RFC Series Oversight Committee. Um, this was something that had been in plan before the discussions which took place at the last, at ITF 102 around the RFC series, um, and, the, and the new set of folks are ready to tackle um, some of the larger issues which face the RFC series. So, um, next slide, please. Uh, there are several uh, additional calls for volunteers uh, currently out by the IED. Uh, we're looking for volunteers for the ICANN TLG, for the IED Plenary Planning Program, and the IRTF Chair. Um, the IRTF Chair, uh, as you know, is appointed by the IED, and uh, its current incumbent, uh, Alison Mankin, has let us know that she will not be standing for another term. Uh, typically, uh, IRTF Chairs do serve for a number of terms because it takes some time to ramp up, uh, but in her case, she found that she was not able to balance uh, family and work commitments with the IRTF Chair commitments commitments in the long term, so we are now looking for another one. Um, this is a particularly important position and from the point of view of the IEB, certainly compared to some of the smaller ones we do, um, because it's really the person who both acts as the visionary for the research agenda um, for the IRTF and somebody who makes sure that its day-to-day uh, uh, -day operations uh, work well. We've tried to support that second one by getting secretariat support uh, for the IRTF chair to, to enable somebody to be more uh, focused on the vision aspect. Um, but it's still something where it's, it's a bit of a combined uh, effort and as a volunteer one, it's quite a significant uh, amount of time. Uh, we will issue the call for volunteers for the ISAC Board of Trustees uh, on November 13th. The timeline has been set to align with the Greater Elections Committee timeline. Uh, so the uh, appointment there will, will sync up with the rest of the ISAC Board of Trustees election committee work. Um, the other two things which are forthcoming are calls for participation in two workshops. Um, one is a joint workshop with the W3C's uh, tag. Um, it's, it's called Escape because we like uh, cutesy names, um, but it's actually an interesting piece of work because it's trying to look at the impact uh, on the publishing industry of signed exchanges and web packaging. You may be familiar with Google's AMP uh, or similar things which uh, take content which was originally published by one uh, group and make it uh, faster or more available uh, by repackaging it and um, giving attribution. Um, it's been somewhat controversial in the publishing community. Um, there's been a sense in which, because it recontextualizes the information, it may be uh, making it harder for uh, different publishers, uh, especially for the smaller ones, uh, to keep people within their own own contexts. Um, and so this is in part looking at that aspect of it, but there's also a reuse of the same technology in, um, in the avoidance of censorship. Um, it's possible to use this to pass information uh, through multiple channels and still attribute it to its original authors. Uh, so you can take information that was originally derived from uh, a source of uh, news or data that's not available in a particular uh, territory or to a particular individual and make it available. So the kind of combination of those two is looking at how the, the publishing industry and how the impact on censorship uh, merge or diverge in the development of this technology. Uh, the other workshop site um, is uh, focused on consolidation and asymmetry. Uh, this is also work that ISOC is taking on and that we've uh, coordinated to some extent with Olaf's team, uh, with Karen O'Donoghue. Um, and the, the focus here is really on um, information asymmetry. We see that there's been a great deal of consolidation in a number of aspects of the internet 
and and while the the internet technologies themselves allow for both federated and, and quite decentralized infrastructures, uh, the utilization of a, a, a common set of services for these um, has driven network effects that has made that they are effectively centralized, even though that's not part of the internet architecture. Uh, so we're looking at uh, both how the, um, the the economics of this work and at how the technology of it might change in order to allow uh, other forms of um, uh, particularly platform uh, publications uh, would occur. And uh, as a result of this, this has uh, been somewhat more difficult to put together because our reaching out to economists is reaching out to a very different community. Um, in, in many ways, uh, our contacts there are, are not nearly as wide or as deep as they are in the technical community. Uh, and so uh, the development of an appropriate uh, call for papers that would actually uh, get the right participation from that community has been, been a bit of a struggle, but is, is ongoing. Uh, the rest of the slides, I believe, are all background material, which uh, the board is welcome to review at its leisure, um, uh, a review of the programs and, and mailing lists, et cetera. Um, certainly not something that we need to take time. Uh, but if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ted. Um, yeah, as Ted mentioned, I mean, please note the the um, fact that one of the appointments is to appoint, you know, one person to this board. And I mean, Richard knows this, but we always reminded that the incumbent needs to actually reapply if, if he, in this case, is willing to to serve another term. And we encourage people to, you know, volunteer in any case. It's always good to have a, a good pool of candidates. Um, <coughs> any questions for Ted? Yeah. In that free contextualization survey you did, was there any pushback from publishers who were convinced you were trying to, to steal their valuable DRM content, or is that? Uh, so it's definitely the case that there are publishers who are concerned uh, that the content is no longer being attributed to them. And uh, if they're <laughs> planning on deriving revenue, for example, from uh, ad impressions on a particular page, that might change if it's repackaged content. So there's definitely an economic piece to that as well. Uh, for DRM, it's slightly different. In the common case, the DRM uh, wouldn't allow the, the, the information to be successfully repackaged because it wouldn't be viewable by somebody who didn't have the right keys. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking there are places where, like, they give you limited access and you can download a watermark PDF. So the watermark PDF issue has not come up before. Okay. Um, if you'd like to, uh, to send a, a comment on it, um, uh, certainly uh, just send it to IV at IV. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Ted, I just wanted to thank the IB for its work on this Australian encryption bill. It is, it's a hugely important issue, and one I've seen from the industry side and from the ISOC side. And so I'm glad to see the IB involved. It's clearly having an impact, and uh, especially in coordination with ISOC. So thanks. Um, well, maybe, I, I mean, it's not my question, but you know, I, I get asked very often in the IETFs. Um, what is the involvement of, of basically you know, the, um, our president with the IAB? Because it used to be that you know, Lynn was basically you not know, joining all the time. And then we had Olaf here. So I think if you guys clarify how you are doing this for the community, that would be useful. Uh, certainly we can do so for the, for the board's uh, information. Uh, some time ago, uh, uh, Kathy made the decision that rather than attending herself, uh, she would find the appropriate members of her senior staff to do that. Um, so it was uh, Matt Ford and Olaf for a period of time. Uh, now it is Karen O'Donoghue and uh, uh, occasionally Olaf as well. Um, and, and realistically what that does is it gives us a, a consistency over time um, because the attention of these people can, can kind of be directed on this rather than um, taking the, um, the travel schedules of the both previous and current CEO. It, into account, it, it can be more difficult for the president and CEO to consistently attend. Obviously, there are other relationships of the president and CEO to the ITF. Uh, the uh, president and CEO um, uh, names the head of the NOMCOM, for example. Um, and so we certainly expect that uh, that uh, structural um, set of uh, uh, relationships will not change uh, to, with the incumbent change. OK, thank you. Um, Alisa. Uh, so as Ted mentioned, our current liaison is Karen O'Donoghue, and I just uh, wanted to say that it's that's been a, a relationship that has worked out very well. Um, you know, we've kind of flagged, she's flagged things early on that ISOC is working on and brought them to the attention of the IAB. Um, I think it's a very effective relationship. 
I sit on the IAB as well, so that's how I know. Because, yeah, and, and to, to make clear, that liaison relationship is, is not a single source of, of information. Um, earlier this week, for example, uh, Konstantinos uh, came and uh, talked to us about some of the extraterritoriality work uh, that he's doing and which dovetails to some of the comments we made uh, about Australia. Um, so there's a, a more of a, a dispatch function which is going on there where the, the point person who's the liaison may connect us to different parts of ISOC. Uh, later in the week, both Matt Ward and, and, and Sally came uh, to talk to us about what had happened with Planetpot and to get uh, input from us on, on other actions. So it's, it's definitely a, a, an important piece of consistency, but it's, it's not the only part of the chain. Yeah, thank you. I, I think, yeah, many people were asking, so I think that was a very good summary. Thanks a lot. Any other question for Ted before we move on to Alisa? Okay, excellent. Th thanks a lot, Ted. Alisa, please. So I don't have the slides and I'm just going to talk. <laughs> Um, so I thought what might be useful today would be to give some highlights of the recent activity in the IETF's technical work, and then also just talk a little, for a moment about um, a few uh, areas we've been working on around diversity and inclusion um, inside the IETF. So um, for the recent technical highlights, um, a lot of the IETF work is, or a lot of the work of most interest is centered in four areas right now, security and privacy, um, uh, automation of network management, um, evolution of the transport layer, and IoT. So I'm just going to run through those four. In security and privacy, we had a huge milestone in August of this year. We published uh, the new TLS 1.3 protocol, Transport Layer Security 1.3. Um, this is probably the most widely used security protocol on the internet. Um, many people in this room were involved uh, in this process, so um, much credit to them. Um, and it makes some, some really significant advances over the previous version 1.2, so um, uh, deprecated some cryptographic algorithms that were known to be vulnerable. Um, it requires perfect forward secrecy, so you get new keys each time, and um, if, if, data is, if previously collected data is breached, then you can't, um, can't decrypt it with, with new keys. Um, and it reduces la the latency of the protocol, so it makes it more performant. Um, this is a huge, huge effort in the IETF, um, and out we drew in people from outside, um, did formal validation of the protocol, um, all kinds of, of tremendous effort went into that. And in the first three months of its deployment, um, we've seen more, more deployment in the first three months since the standard was published than um, TLS 1.2 saw in its first five years. So um, kind of gotten a little bit better at um, tying the incentives to deploy these things to the design of the protocol. Um, another uh, uh, Upcoming milestone will be the publication of a standard called ACME. Richard has been involved in this. Um, ACME stands for Automated Certificate Management Environment. It's a it's a protocol to make it easier to to manage certificates. Um, uh, in, folks may have heard of a new certificate authority that was created a couple of years ago called Let's Encrypt. It gives away free certificates. Um, Let's Encrypt uses the the ACME protocol. They were kind of designed together. Um, also in the security area, we've recently published uh, two new transports for DNS, DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS. So these don't change the core DNS protocol, but they provide for encrypted um, ways of, of transporting the DNS information on the internet, um, in particular between local clients on your machine and recursive resolvers. And there's support already for both of these in many, uh, many clients and many server implementations. You're running it on your machine there. Um, I wanted to mention this in particular DNS over HTTPS because you're likely to see it in the news um, in uh, coming months. Uh, some ways that, that people are talking about deploying it are uh, potentially slightly controversial, and there's an interplay with the discussion that, that Ted was uh, mentioning about consolidation on the internet, so it's just a, an area to watch. Um, and lastly, in the security area, we have a new, a relatively new working group, um, uh, Message Layer Security, MLS which is focused on um, key management for group messaging. So as we have noticed, group messaging applications like WhatsApp and Signal uh, um, have become extremely popular on the internet. Uh, and uh, they're not standardized. And this will not standardize the actual messaging protocol, but um, will provide a standardized way for managing the encryption keys. 
we have participation in that group from um, Google, from Facebook, from WhatsApp, from Wire, um, Cisco. So um, lots of the major players are, are there. So that's kind of the, the latest um, tidbits on security and privacy. On network configuration and management, people may know that we have this technology called Yang, um, which was standardized some time ago. Uh, and it's basically like the, the next generation um, configuration language that uh, allows network operators to uh, manage and configure their networks in an automated way. So as opposed to having to do everything manually when you have um, you know, billions of new IoT devices on your network, that just doesn't work. Um, we needed a new tool set um, to be able to automate that and create software and create APIs that can manage the networks for you. We've published um, 75 Yang models uh, in the IETF thus far. There's about 200 more in the pipeline. Um, that's like a major, a major wave of change uh, to, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the scale. Um, you just see like Yang exploding all over the IETF right now. Um, and that's, uh, that is likely to continue for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, in particular, we have a set of documents that are nearing completion right now, which are focused on, on telemetry, which is kind of a key component for the industry right now. So we have all this information that comes off your routers and switches that's um, uh, you know, firing off information about the network, and we needed a standardized way to publish that information and to collect it so that operators can then analyze it and have a uh, kind of real-time understanding of, of what's happening on the network. Um, so those documents, uh, in particular, one of their the phrase you might look for is Yang push. Um, they've been in development for a long time and um, are finally coming to completion. And then the last thing I'll mention here is just that um, the board may remember that uh, last year, I think the IESG wrote uh, a note to you, Gonzalo, that you shared with the board about getting some funding for something called the Yang Catalog, which is a, a tool set that has been developed by volunteers in the IETF community, um, which basically helps uh, with the deployment of Yang. So it helps operators um, understand what are all these Yang models out there. Um, Yang has this property where the models can be very interdependent, so one model can augment another model, and you end up with this huge complicated dependency graph. Um, the Yang catalog allows people to visualize that graph, to understand the status of the different models, to search based on different metadata fields. Um, it's basically just uh, a, a set of tools that create a means for um, operators to, to it makes it easier for operators to use Yang, basically, because it's a bit of a complicated technology. Um, so we were looking for some funding to continue that work because it's kind of a big project and, um, and wanted to sort of use it as an experiment to um, see if the IETF itself could develop some software that would help the deployment of IETF technology. Um, we didn't quite get there on the funding from the board, but we ended up with some funding coming through a different uh, source based on a, a platinum member. Um, of ISOC, and so we've been able to, to kind of um, fill in the gap for a few months here. And then as of next year, um, uh, according to the budget that the, the LLC has, uh, uh, is in the process of working on, um, we've, uh, we've budgeted to be able to support that work in, in 2019. Um, and we have a developer who's going to um, continue on, on contract working on that. Um, next area is transport. So um, people may be aware that there's a revolution going on in, in the um, transport layer of the network, a uh, new protocol called QUIC, um, Q-U-I-C, which was uh, originally developed out of Google but has been in progress in the IETF for, um, for some number of years. And this is kind of a major development because uh, it's not very often that a new transport protocol gets deployed, can, can get deployed on the internet. So we've standardized a lot of them, uh, and not many of them have been, have been deployed widely other than TCP and UDP. Uh, but QUIC is expected to be deployed quite widely. Um, the key features of QUIC are um, that ease of deployment. It's basically um, designed in such a way that you can get it out onto the network more easily. Um, again, focusing on reducing latency, which is, um, you know, a big motivator for, uh, for web companies in particular. Um, and it's, the entire protocol is encrypted always, um, so there's no unencrypted mode. Um, and it, encry it encrypts uh, the transport headers, which is a new and different feature from, from the way that, that TCP is deployed. Uh, so again, here we have a very wide interest in this work. Um, all of the major web companies involved, uh, all of the largest content delivery networks, um, all the major browsers. Um, and there's already something like 15 implementations of this, uh, people working on interops um, in between the meetings uh, and hoping to see um, progress towards publication of this protocol sometime next year. Um, there's also lots of follow-on work 
to Quick, which is already being contemplated. So people looking at running HTTP over Quick, run, running WebRTC, the, the web-based real-time uh, uh, protocol stack that, that we've done. Um, uh, so there's, there's lots of further work that's anticipated in that area. And then finally, we come to IoT. Um, so in IoT, we have, uh, we're basically spanning kind of every, every area of, of, of technical work that's uh, related to IoT and is, and is within the network stack of the ITF, we're doing it. So um, in particular, there's been a strong focus on security lately. Uh, we've been looking at how to do software updates securely for IoT devices and also how to leverage trusted hardware. Um, so that, so uh, as trusted hardware has become more common in the marketplace, we need new protocols to figure out how do you actually interact with it? How can you get an application bootstrapped off of it? Um, so we have a couple of new working groups looking at that. Um, we've also been looking at network-based network -based security. So um, people may have heard of a, a, a soon-to-be-published protocol, which is called MUD, Manufacturer Usage Descriptions. Um, and the idea of MUD is that this is so it's a means to allow uh, the, the operator of the network to figure out which protocols a device is supposed to be speaking. So, you know, your light bulb is probably not intending to send email. If, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you find that it is, that's probably a problem. Um, so uh, the, the MUD standard um, is, is a means for essentially determining uh, what you should be expecting from a device that, that enters your network. We have a bunch of work as well around um, getting these devices onto the network uh, securely and in a way that makes sense. So lots of IoT devices, they have they don't have any security credentials uh, that they come with. They have no knowledge of what the local network is going to be. They're intended to be deployed in many different kinds of environments, um, and they have uh, uh, no user interface that you can that you can interact with. So we have a couple of um, different proposals in the works. One of them is um, affectionately called Brusky, B R S K B R S K I Bootstrapping Remote Secure Key Infrastructure, uh, um, uh, which is uh, again this. Kind of means to get securely onto the network even when you have um, you have sort of starting from nothing um, and another one which is um, looking a little bit more at reusing some of the authentication protocols uh, that were developed originally um, for a mobile context and then lastly at the at the network layer um, we have a bunch of work going on to sort of unify unify and create a unified framework for um, uh, getting devices networked over um, different kinds of lower layer technologies uh, so Things like Sigfox, uh, LoRa, um, Wisun. Uh, there's lots of these different um, lower layer networking protocols. We wanted within the within the context of IPv6 to provide uh, a uniform way for these devices to be networked, um, regardless of what the underlying protocol looked like. So lots of lots of different efforts and, and energy there on IoT. Um, on diversity and inclusion, uh, we have a few different kind of new things that that we are uh, doing um, as of this meeting, actually. Uh, so I thought the board might be interested in that. Um, one is that we have relaunched our, um, our mentoring program for uh, new people to the IETF. It's now called the IETF Guides Program. Um, so this was kind of on hiatus for a little while. We were, trying to, we were trying to figure out how to make it more effective and we have new people um, leading the program. Uh, so this here at this meeting was the first time that, um, that, we, that we did it as IETF Guides. I think it was still um, starting kind of fairly small, small scale, but hoping to grow it in the future. Uh, we also have, I think, just better communication in general between uh, the Internet Engineering Steering Group, the IESG, um, and the folks at ISOC who um, work on the fellows programs to the IETF. Um, so we now have uh, someone on our, in our group, um, Alvaro Vatana, who's one of the routing ADs, who's been working closely with Niall Harper um, on Terrell's team. Um, uh, just so that we're, um, you know, we keep in touch better about who are the fellows who are coming, how many of them, what are their areas of interest. Um, at this meeting, as you probably know, uh, the program was also expanded to um, uh, to provide financial support just for the meeting registration fee for five people. So they are not really part of the fellows program, but it's it's more people who are, um, you know, being encouraged to attend um, with a small uh, a small subsidy and. Um, um, we're just, you know, trying to track what those people are interested in and, and make them feel welcome in the IETF. I, I met one of them at the hackathon and he was very enthusiastic and, um, and I ran into him in the elevator the other day and he said, you know, he was, it was I mean, it's, you know, the hackathon, I, I literally saw him like the very beginning of the meeting first day and he like sat down, found a group to work on some WebRTC stuff and then last night, very end of the meeting, he's like heading to a side meeting at 
7 p.m. So he had the full experience of the IETF, um, which I think is great. Uh, and then also this week we had um, in the IETF plenary discussion a, a rather lengthy um, Q&A session about um, whether or not the IETF is welcoming to new people and what we can do uh, to make it more welcoming, um, especially to newcomers, um, uh, people for whom English is not their first language and, and so on. And I think the leadership will be um, taking back a lot of the feedback that we heard and um, trying to figure out how we can um, make, make the IETF a more welcoming environment. Thank you. That's, I mean, that's a very comprehensive summary of what happened. So thanks a lot. I think that's, that's really useful. Um, do we have any? Yes, Olga. Thank you to the three of you. It was very, very clear explanation of all the, the great work that you do. I have a question about mentoring, Alisa. Who are the mentorees? Are the, are the fellows that come with the fellowship? Are people that it's, it's new to the environment but not a fellow? both of them and you know how difficult it is to engage people who are not English uh, speaking as, as the native language so how, how do you feel that it's it's changing yeah with the mentoring so, yeah the um, so the mentoring program it program is open to everyone um, anyone can sign up to be a, a participant in it and I know that there were some fellows who also signed up for the ITF guides program um, I think it's it's, it will be interesting to track. I, I, I saw a mentor um, with her, or she was looking for her mentee at the, at the our welcome reception. Um, and I think because ISOC does such a good job of um, getting people ready and introducing them to each other that she actually couldn't find her mentee because she was already off busy talking to people who she had met through the program. So I think it's just, you know, as we, as we go forward, we can kind of iron out the details of how it works. But right now it's open to, um, it's open to everyone. Um, and uh, as far as uh, um, you know, use of use of English, I think we have um, an opportunity here where if, we're, if we are going to kind of talk about what, so well, something that came out of the plenary was that um, it seems like it's kind of time to uh, revamp the training that we provide to uh, working group chairs around uh, lots of different logistical and um, you know cultural and interactive issues that happen during a working group meeting. I think another part of that is to, um, you know, continue to push forward on the working group chairs to get the materials in ahead of time so that people can have time to read, um, to just be a little bit more, um, uh, to have a little bit of, of higher oversight in terms of how people are interacting in the microphone lines. This was kind of the, the essence of, of what we talked about at the plenary. Um, and I think a component of that is like ensuring that everybody understands what was said and giving people time to be able to respond and so on. Um, so hopefully, even though I think the genesis of that conversation was not about language barrier issues, that um, all of the knock-on effects would, would be beneficial for that case as well. Well, it is next. Yes, thank you very much, Ed. I'm really excited to see that uh, the ITF has also caught on the blockchain aspect, which is very important because uh, given that there's uh, discussion about smart contracts and smart cities and smart villages and, and uh, this is also something of uh, interest because i've uh, been reached i've been approached by ethereum and they've been interested in joining the itf and somehow and uh, there has been a bit of a an invisible wall <laughs> they couldn't crack it uh, in fact they've had some discussion as a gm and that's one thing that where where might be a might be of interest to see if we can find ways of making it easier for them to join. Uh, I'm going to take this because one of the ways that they actually uh, tried to, to talk to us was with the distributed internet uh, infrastructure research group, um, which is under Alison Mangle. Um, and one of the issues that, that came up there that caused a bit of a, uh, a wall, not so invisible, is the fact that bringing work into the IETF um, involves giving up change control. Uh, functionally, what happens when you bring work to the IETF that's been developed outside is you tell the IETF, um, you may make um, derivative work of this, um, and that derivative work is then under the change control of the IETF. Uh, the folks at Ethereum um, found that problematic given their circumstances, and it's certainly something uh, that can cause issues. In the, in the past, for example, when we worked with uh, the folks who uh, were building XMPP, uh, it 
there, there were certain standards that came into the IETF um, and certain standards uh, that, that stayed outside as a result of the, uh, uh, of the change control issue. I think there is a possibility um, uh, to continue to work together, especially in the research group here, um, because there's some very interesting pieces of their technology that um, would go well with the consensus protocols uh, that NRG is looking at like Stellar. However, it, it is realistic uh, to, to be a bit cautious here for two reasons. One is neither the Dinergy nor the other working groups uh, kind of go that fast. And they're very deliberative bodies. They think very carefully about uh, what the impact of the different technology is going to be across a, a variety of parts of the stack. And, and not just Ethereum, but many of the other um, blockchain folks who've approached us um, have either a perception that they need to move fast or because they have a um, an initial coin offering or something else that they're also doing, uh, they, they can't really give their attention to these very long-term term efforts. So it, it, it's a bit of an issue there. Uh, the other thing is, realistically, there, there are two classes of technologies that we lump together and which Ethereum in, involves. One is um, a mechanism for reporting uh, actions. And the second is a kind of data governance. Um, and the consensus protocols or the, the other mechanisms that do the data governance to figure out who can write into these particular, um, you know, uh, essentially public ledgers uh, is a separable question from how the public ledgers work. There's already been public ledger work um, here at the ITF and in, in the HTTP world um, around certificate transparency, but the, the choices there about how the data governance works uh, are, are completely separate. And I think one of the things that's difficult is for any of these other groups to kind of keep those two things separate, because for them, um, their use cases are driven by that combination of uh, the data governance method that they have and the, um, and the, the technology aspects of the public ledger. Um, so we're certainly happy to continue to work with the Ethereum Foundation. Um, but it is something where the, the, the differences in how we look at the technology and the differences in how change control work has made simply just saying, y'all come, um, a little bit difficult. Because when they've been invited in, the, the barriers to um, uh, handing the, the work over and having it separated in this way um, have really been uh, derived from the business models or the, the foundational goals of the organization. Just one other note on, on that. Um, I, I have talked a little bit to uh, someone who's uh, essentially consulting for uh, Ethereum, and um, it's really interesting because uh, I think they are kind of at a, a place from the governance structure perspective that the IETF was like 30 years ago. Uh, you know, he, he wanted to talk to me because he's like, oh, we have all these people who are coming and they're making the same proposals that were made already. <laughs> it's like, Indeed, when you have like an open community-based process, this is something that tends to happen. And so you sort of need a structure in place to be able to figure out how to deal with that. And if you've documented the previous decision, then you can refer the person back to like, you know, no, we're not going to reopen the design of IPv6. It's been done since, you know, whatever time. Um, but they don't have that right now because it's all, you know, it's been like a very organic process. So they have, have there's some features of their process. They have ERCs and they're numbered and they go out to last call. Like it's, there's similarity with the IETF process, um, but it's 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 been created organically, and so I think they're. It seemed to me like they're at the point of thinking about, um, you know, what where do we take this next, and how do we manage the contributions when the community of interest has grown so wide, um, and so that's just I think separately kind of an interesting phenomenon to keep track of, even if whether the technology. I mean, if the technology comes into the IETF somehow, as Ted was explaining, then that is maybe not an issue because. That's what the point of the IETF process, and it's well honed. Um, but if they do, you know, continue with their own process for the, this, um, to kind of look at the parallels with other existing processes in the, in the internet space, I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I sort of a meta comment here, um, which is at the, at the plenary, um, there was some discussion about a camp, guy who came into the ex, the extra working group and was perceived as being blown off. You know, and I actually have. And it was actually, it was actually, I happen to know him pretty well. And it turned out to be a complete failure to understand um, sort of the way things work, you know, and then 
people come up with the ITF all the time and say, I have this wonderful, fabulous thing. I want you to standardize it as is. And we say, no. And, you know, and they, and they frequently perceive it as saying, well, there were a bunch of, of hoity toity people who weren't interested in my ideas. Whereas the reality is the ITF is a very, it's this culture that's developed over 30 years that, you know, <clears throat> we fiddle with stuff and we adjust it and we, and we improve it. And we don't really do it. And, you know, we have, and we have the culture of rough consensus, which, as I've said, requires people being able to say this is this is not perfect, but it's good enough. And we do a lousy job of communicating that culture to other people. And when they show up, you know, and people show up and they like it doesn't fit with the culture. I mean, we don't really like to explain it's like it's not you. It's just like it's, this is not this is, this is us. And the Ethereum thing sounds like the same thing. It's like here it's wonderful. Like well, not quite. So. As I said, metaphorically, you know, it would be really nice if we had the equivalent of, of you must take a shower before you can, before you can enter the pool. And yeah, and I, I wish we could figure out some way to do that that wasn't that didn't wasn't perceived as being exclusionary and drive people away. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can talk about this at the plenary, but um, I think it's really tricky because the standards process is inherently exclusionary. If we were going to standardize everything, we wouldn't be worth much. The whole point of like choosing standards is to is to interoperate. Um, so, but that doesn't that doesn't dictate the the tenor of any conversation necessarily. Right. It's, um, it's exclusionary about products and ideas, but 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 I, but, it's, but we hope not about people. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, one one hope that I have, uh, which I don't know whether this will come to fruition or not, and it's not up to me to decide, but I I hope that um, by setting up the LLC, we will be able to invest a little bit more in the area of training and um, an outreach and this this whole area, which we currently do through volunteer efforts, um, which is which has been fantastic work. Um, but I just, I, get, I have a sense that there's a lot more that we could do here if we had a little bit more dedicated resource over time to this. Um, so I'm hoping that that's something that can be worked on. Do, do you want to? I just wanted to make a comment. It seems like it's calling for some kind of informational, you know, uh, RFC or BCP to explain how things work. It might be helpful if uh, you're going to look into this problem of um, explaining. Like how to take showers or. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, well, we have the DAO of, of yeah. IETF, which is more or less up to date. The question is getting people, making people aware of it and persuading them to read it. Yeah, we're actually doing a big update of the DAO right now. So there's this document called the DAO of the IETF, which is sort of supposed to explain how the IETF works. Um, I think in some past iterations, it hasn't quite taken its full audience into mind when, when being written. Um, so we're trying to ameliorate that. And also thinking about how we can make it more consumable. So the editors are, um, you know, working with Greg Wood, um, who uh, provides communication support for us to, you know, think about breaking it up into pieces. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big wall of text right now, and I think uh, it would probably be more useful if it had a different format. Just, just to note, it is a wiki, right? So it's a. It's that, not a wiki. Well, right? I mean, we publish, we publish versions of it. It's okay. not a wiki. Yeah. Well, wiki is the wrong way to put it. So. It's a web page, yeah, <laughs> with a it's lot well of words on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Any any other question at this point? Okay, but then thanks a lot. I mean, to to the three of you, you know, Glenn, Ted, and Alisa. I mean, I think this was really useful and uh, and you know a very good use of time because in a very short time, you know, all trustees they they basically figure out you know what's going on. So hey, thank you very much. Um. Okay, so moving on in the, in the agenda, we have uh, point number six, which is to get the, the report, the OMAC report. Um, yesterday they, they had a meeting, so I'm sure that Jim can share interesting information with all of us. So, thank you very much. I'm uh, James Galvin. I think that uh, most of you here in the room know me. I'm a popular member of the Peanut Gallery. 
today I get to wear a more, uh, you know, more formal hat, and uh, I, I welcome the opportunity. And uh, thank you for, uh, on behalf of the OMAC, our privilege of uh, coming up to uh, talk to the Board of Trustees and give our report. As Gonzalo indicated, we had a meeting yesterday. Um, so naturally, uh, you got a board report from the OMAC this morning. And I'm sure you've all read it thoroughly, and, and I really don't have to speak. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I'll make a few uh, bullet points here. So if you switch to the next slide, uh, what I did is I just had one slide with a list of the agenda topics, and I'll just speak to them. Um, Kevin has a, a package. I don't know for sure if he has sent it yet. Uh, but I tried to do something a little different than we've done in the past. There, there's a notes file in there, uh, which was uh, taken kindly by uh, Anita Walker. I took notes during the meeting. Um, you'll see the agenda with, that was there. And there's also a complete set of all the slides that were used at the meeting. So essentially, it's a, it's a nice package of what happened at the OMAC meeting so that you, you have the complete uh, context. And uh, in addition, then, I'll, I'll speak here about the, the few points. Hopefully in the future, if we manage to have a, a few more meetings uh, you know, between board meetings and, and we give an update, then uh, you'll be able to get things a little more in advance and, and have seen uh, some of the stuff that's going on. So we opened the meeting uh, with uh, staff introductions, which brings up sort of a difference in the way the OMAC has run before. As you're aware, there's always been this issue of OMAC engagement and relationship with the board and the staff. So. I've been with, uh, along with Crystal, uh, my co-chair, uh, been working with the staff and, and uh, with Andrew too, uh, thanks very much for that, to think about how we might do things a little differently. So we're kind of experimenting a little bit uh, in a way to reach out and bring more OMAC members into the fold. So we're trying to find a way through our meetings and our meeting format uh, and the way that staff are reporting to, to the OMAC you know, as a way to, to hopefully bring in some people. So in particular, we did not do a, a toward the table kind of thing, which is very popular at meetings where you go around and everybody introduce themselves. Uh, I immediately chose the path of just having the staff be introduced. Uh, the idea being that people should have a way of knowing who the staff are that are in the room and what their role is so that if they want to you know, reach out to people, they can do that. Uh, the, the assumption is that people would get to know who the other OMAC members are over time and also, frankly, it's a time constraint, you know, I mean, you got a room full of 40 people, it takes a while to do even just your name and affiliation, it tends to take more than 10 minutes and just didn't want to use that much time. We then moved the meeting into, uh, Andrew Sullivan created a, a new format for what he wants to do with meeting with the OMAC and had a session called, you know, Ask Me Anything. Um, he did give a bit of an introduction and a presentation you know, about uh, you know, his vision and, and uh, relationship with the OMAC and such, and we just kind of opened the floor. Now, it, you know, wasn't, there were a couple of good questions and, and some good discussion. It, it wasn't uh, an extended deep discussion, but that's okay. You know, we have to, you have to try something and, and you start somewhere and, and hopefully the next time around we'll, we'll do a little better. And then he moved into uh, handing it over to Anita to give a presentation about the new uh, strategic partnership uh, for the membership model. Um, which I gather he's going to say more about here to the board too. Um, and the, the essence of that was just to reboot uh, the uh, change that was announced uh, last year in, in a new membership model um, and open it more as a concept discussion with the OMAC uh, and just lay out the characteristics of the new things that the staff are going to try some new ideas that they have for creating a membership model and open a dialogue to get more discussion. So we're hoping that over time here, uh, the staff will have an opportunity to get more feedback from folks. And in any case, they're gonna try some of the things that were listed by Anita. One of the things in particular is the staff has taken on doing a regular newsletter now that goes out to the OMAC. And I guess it's come out three times, I think, something like that. Every, every couple of weeks is just sort of a summary of what's going on. And I welcome that. I, I think that's it's good transparency. It, it's important for people to see. Um, we'll we'll find the right balance along the way here about how much information and frequency, because you want to make sure that people stay engaged and they actually look at the messages. But you know, that's one example. And then other kinds of face-to-face -face meetings that you know, the staff will organize and try to have in general with membership. 
So it was a good discussion. Um, and several people acknowledged and thanked the, the staff and for the opportunity to work with them. And it was good to know that the organization had heard the comments of at least you know some number of uh, organizational members about the new membership model that was being drafted last year. So I do want to pass on you know thanks from the OMAC that you know our, our voices were heard and we're being given an opportunity to work more closely with staff to see where we can go to, to make all of this better for both of us. I then moved into a discussion of OMAC engagement. Uh, for the board members who were there, uh, and if they're board members who were present in Montreal, it's a very similar set of slides. In, in essence, the key feature that trying to move towards, uh, there were two basic things that are important here in OMAC engagement from my point of view uh, as, as an incoming chair. Um, trying to create a greater opportunity for dialogue and, and ways to force that dialogue if we can. Um, it's been common in, in OMAC meetings for them to be a bit more of uh, information you know, from ISAW to the OMAC. Um, and I really wanted to try and change that in a way to, to force it to be about a dialogue and a, and a discussion and move updates out of the OMAC meeting, take those kind of things out of the high value face-to-face -face meetings. So the change that even Andrew presented and offered up in the Ask Me Anything is you know, a good way to kickstart. It's a dialogue. Everything's a dialogue and everything is a discussion. And so I wanted to go through and emphasize that again in this uh, OMAC engagement model. Um, we're creating the model that says that you know, ISOC has essentially three categories of um, its initiatives that uh, it creates. It'll always have work and things that it does that are independent of membership. And, and that's appropriate. ISOC has many revenue sources and uh, you certainly have a larger mission and scope than just meeting the needs of membership. So there'll always be things that ISOC will do that are both chapters and members might not have any direct relationship with. And we have to keep that in mind and acknowledge that and represent it. But what we're ultimately looking for is a way in which to deal with opportunities for staff and, and OMAC, the ISOC organization and the OMAC to work together. So there'll be initiatives that will be joint. And, and we need to have predictable behaviors for how those kinds of activities take place. So that's a place to get to yet. We haven't really resolved the process to get there, but we're looking for that to happen. And then of course, the, the, we'd like to, to more formally uh, create an opportunity for there to be initiatives that members want to move forward with. And, you know, for ISOC to have a structure, um, an infrastructure, if you will, and support for, for those things. I mean, naturally, all of these things have to fit under the scope of ISOC's mission and purpose, but there isn't any reason why an organization could look to ISOC to help facilitate a particular activity if it's, if it's relevant to ISOC to do that. So just talking about that relationship and those categories of things, and over time here, we're gonna to move towards trying to understand uh, those particular work products and making that work. The second big thing was about meeting logistics. And an issue that's always been present with the OMAC is when and where does it have its face-to-face -face meetings? For those who've been around for a while, you know that the OMAC, uh, the advisory council has always met at ITF meetings in the early days. It was just at ITF meetings three times a year. Um, and you know, that was the only place that you met people. And over time, staff you know, grew, grew that opportunity into also having a meeting at ICANN meetings, a meeting at IGF, um, and some other different discussions along the way. What uh, I was trying to call out was a clear distinction between ISOC creating its networking opportunities, and it'll do those of its own accord from time to time and probably have a lot of them. And maybe they'll have them at multiple ICANN meetings and multiple ITF meetings. So I wanted to separate out the point of having an OMAC meeting. Uh, we wanna have our own high value face-to-face -face meetings and make them our meetings for ourselves and by ourselves and, and really focus on trying to make them productive for ourselves. And this meeting that we had this time yesterday was the first, the first time in this format change what we did was we tried to conduct a survey with our OMAC members on where they would like to have meetings and have these face-to-face -face meetings. The, the survey was 
good and bad, I suppose. It certainly, in many ways, was not statistically significant. We only got 25 responses. But it was sufficient. My, my takeaway in the survey results was not that I, I didn't really learn anything I, I didn't know, but it was useful to observe that there are at least a set of people who all want a meeting at an ICANN meeting, who all want a meeting at an IETF and at an IGF. And there was essentially an equivalent set of people that found that each of those meeting sites was an appropriate place to have a meeting. RSA data security was uh, also offered in the list in the survey. We had all of the meeting opportunities and sites. And there was some support for that. I, even though there was very limited number of people who selected that as something they wanted to do, uh, you know, we still feel strongly that it's important to have a meeting in that spot. I suspect that's more about not having the OTA members properly integrated and, and welcomed as, as part of the OMAC yet. I mean, they obviously are there, they're on the mailing list, um, but I, I don't think that we get properly connected with them. So even though there was a limited uh, desire for having a meeting there, um, we're, we're still gonna have a, a meeting in that location. And in fact, uh, we got one additional suggestion for a meeting site to have a meeting, which was uh, at the MOG meetings. Uh, someone had selected that we have them there. So for next year, the goal here is, is next year we'll again put up a, a, a survey and we'll ask people where they'd like to have meetings and we'll add all the MOG meetings in there for 2020 and we'll, we'll see what we get from that. And maybe we'll do something a little different. The end result of all of this was to choose to have one uh, face-to-face -face OMAC meeting at each of the four uh, events, you know, coinciding with each of the four events that seem interesting to people. So there'll be one at an ITF in 2019, one at an ICANN, uh, one at the RSA Data Security Conference, and then one at the IGF next year. Um, and in fact, we uh, chose the schedule and laid out those dates. Um, and they actually, uh, except in two of them actually match up with, with Board of Trustee meetings. Uh, they'll, they'll be in the same locations with, with Board of Trustees, so that'll work out very nice. Um, I do want to you know, make sure to extend um, that you, you do know, uh, and you, know, you are welcome at, at OMAC meetings. Board of Trustee members are always welcome to come and, and, and attend the OMAC meeting. So we're ever there in that particular locality. One interesting point that came up in the discussion about meetings was um, to make sure that they are open to all organizational members, even if they're not at the event. The RSA Data Security Conference was the particular one that came up because being in Silicon Valley, there's a fair number of people in that area. So, you know, staff took on board the, the obvious requirement in that case of making sure that whatever venue they set up that meeting to happen, it'll be such that anybody from the area who happens to be around can get into the meeting. You won't be obligated to have been part of RSA data security. So uh, we'll, we'll sort that out. And I know I spent quite a bit of time talking about logistics and such, but I, I think it's an important part of um, you know, trying to reach out to members and trying to create an opportunity for people to be engaged, to be a part of things. Um, it's a bit of an experiment, but at least we, we have a model, we, we have an action plan, and we'll just see how it goes over the next year. And if it works, then we'll do it again. And if it doesn't work, we'll think of something different for the following year. I think that's the best we can do right now. Um, Megan Cruz uh, also took an opportunity to talk about the uh, committee reboot, the OTA committee reboot. So again, just highlighting to all OMAC members that there is an opportunity here to be engaged and be part of things. And then, of course, the last thing was uh, Constantinos uh, did a, a reprisal of his unintended consequences of regulation for the Internet. Um, as it turns out, that was, at least from my point of view, um, just nicely coincident and may, maybe an accident to have seen that presentation. Um, in the spirit of distinguishing OMAC meetings from ISOC having its networking meetings, ISOC had one of its networking meetings at the ICANN meeting in Barcelona two weeks ago. Um, and during that meeting, Constantinos was you know, the, the main attraction, if you will. Um, and so we invited him explicitly to come to the, the OMAC meeting this time around and, and do the same thing. Those OMAC uh, members who, who were there, and, and we did have a few in remote participation. So I think the last thing that I'll point out in all this is we are going to, I, we had asked for the OMAC meeting to be recorded um, so that we have that. Um, we're going to try to uh, manage that, announce that onto the OMAC list. 
uh, and make that available to people. Uh, I do have a, a package, the same package that was sent to the board earlier. I have not yet sent it to the OMAC, but I'll do that right after uh, this discussion here. Um, and again, just trying to report out better, be a little more transparent, give people an opportunity to, to see what's going on and, and to change things. We're uh, very much hoping that we can create uh, dialogue meetings at each of our OMAC meetings and, and make it work in that respect. Um, we will also set up uh, single topic uh, Zoom televideo meetings for OMAC meetings. Um, that was the one thing I almost forgot to mention here in terms of meeting logistics. I, the distinction that I want to make is for the high value face-to-face -face meetings, I want them to really be a dialogue opportunity um, between OMAC and the board and the staff. You know, let's sort of figure out how to make that work and, and how to leverage that and, and make that available to people. I, I see the, the topic discussions as an opportunity for two kinds of things. There may be times when OMAC members really would like to hear from ISOC a bit about other things that ISOC is doing. So from my point of view, that's the opportunity for more of a presentation Q&A kind of thing that might happen um, on behalf of staff to the OMAC or if OMAC have a need and staff are willing to meet that need, that would be the opportunity to do that. I really want to try to bring the OMAC meetings around to a, a more of a dialogue opportunity and, and see if we can make that happen. So that's my uh, report from here. Again, thank you, and I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have all down paper. Yeah, I, I think that was a good summary of the meeting. I, I was there, and I think the the kind of you know goal of, of making the the OMA community more engaged. I think that's that's exactly the right goal because um, yeah, as you said, I mean nowadays it's kind of like you know. Um, trying to drag them into doing things. So, um, yeah, if you need any support from us, I mean, we would be more than happy to do that because that's, that's exactly, you know, what, you know, we, we think you should be doing as well. So, um, so I have Olga and Robert. Okay, so Pepper and Olga. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, James. This is actually quite good. I'm fortunate, as you know, I was trying to be there. I was actually on a plane doing the meeting when they <clears throat> wouldn't let me um, access it remotely with the video. Um, uh, so, but one of the uh, questions was the, the actually the engagement. I think Andrew there with the ask me anything was good. A lot of the face-to-face -face meetings. I'm thinking specifically of the one during WSIS in um, Geneva. Um, people came. There was no discussion. Nobody actually said anything. It was more that, as you described it, the ISOC staff presenting what we're doing, um, but there was no sort of real engagement. Was there any more engagement this time, or is it basically one way? Because frankly, if that's what it is, um, it's not worth it. Because I know when we take a look at when we were in Geneva, the cost, right? I mean, literally, the financial cost of doing it, and especially, and part of the problem was in the middle of busy meetings and trying to get people to show up, um, the attendance wasn't what we had wanted. Um, and I'm just wondering, for example, about the RSA thing. IGF is next year going to be in Vanuatu. Um, the question, which is, so it's a big question about who's actually going to be there. <clears throat> where, you know, where's, how do you get to Vanuatu? Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about that, right? I, yeah, uh, we're already worrying about that. So the question is, is it, are the same people who already go to the OMAC meetings who are going to ICANN, IGF, et cetera, the only ones showing up? And is this really... Um, effective way as building the broader engagement by the OMAC members. And I think that's frankly what we have to really be focusing on. And so I appreciate the efforts in trying to get more interaction, but you know, um, if we're just repeating what we're already doing, but it's not engaged and successful, why are we doing it again and again? I'd just like to get some feedback from people who actually were there, and again, I apologize for not being able to be there, but I was actually fighting the unintended consequence of regulating the internet, right, at the planning process. So. Yeah, um, if, if I may, um, I'll say two things. So about this meeting in particular, I, I think there were six um, OMAC members. Uh, I mean, otherwise it was um, uh, really just staff and others. You know, I don't know if that's a, a problem or not. I mean, the one thing to keep in mind is that this particular IETF, uh, the OMAC meeting, overlapped with uh, uh, IETF meeting time. 
um, in the past, it's, it has managed to be slotted in between IETF meeting times. So, um, you know, that might have impacted whether people wanted to come or, or not, because they might not have wanted to come late and they, or they might not have wanted to leave early to go to the next meeting. I, I, you know, that, that does not have an easy answer. That just is what it is, and that'll always be true. Um, I also don't want to, you know, lose the uh, observation that, you know, Zoom is an option, and we do want to keep that in mind. It is true that if we don't get a significant number of physical people in a room, then maybe we should just make it a Zoom meeting altogether. Um, and that brings me to my, my second comment, which is for the RSA Data Security Conference meeting that's going to come up in, in March of this year, that'll be the next OMAC meeting and the next opportunity to have it. It's interesting that neither Crystal nor I are available to go and to chair that meeting. Um, so one of the things that, I mean, staff has actually offered to, to host that meeting, uh, to be the, the chair and moderate the meeting, and we've actually pushed back on that um, and, and pushed back kind of strongly and just said, you know, that's, that's a nice offer and we appreciate that and it's very kind, but my, my view is that this is an OMAC meeting and if OMAC members want the meeting, then somebody has to step up and be the acting chair for the day. And if nobody wants to do that, then we won't have a meeting, which is kind of where I really wanted to get to. You're right to raise the question of whether or not the meetings are productive and are we getting enough people in them. And, and I am sensitive to that issue. Uh, and we are thinking about that and dealing, talking about that with, with, with staff. We do have a desire to make sure that we get a significant number of people. They do do RSVPs for the meetings. And, and so we have some sense of who at least thinks they're coming. I think the numbers for yesterday were much larger than those who actually came. But we're hoping that by doing a better job of reporting out after a meeting, one of the things I like about the uh, Zoom opportunity reporting is I also asked for a uh, time list of presentations to be created so that people could easily skip forward to the spot they want to see and not have to watch it. You know, so the staff will be you know, preparing that, that Zoom recording in such a way that we hope to make it useful and we'll try to track and see if people use it. Um, I, I think maybe my one closing comment is just, you know, yes, uh, thank you for your, your comments and your question and concern. We are thinking about those things. And we are going to do our yeah. best to try and, to manage and them going again, forward. I, no, I appreciate that. And I think the, the Zoom recording, I think, is a great innovation. And I actually think that that will help. Um, uh, and again, I'd be just interested in maybe offline talk about it. You know, so how many of the people who are here, you know, is the RSA, especially given, you know, it's a subset of a subset, whether that just because somebody is there in the room and says, oh, I'm going to be there, I'd like a meeting then, is not necessarily the reason to say yes. If there's enough of a critical mass, absolutely yes. But I think that we really do need to focus on the critical mass issue. And, um, you know, I do think that, you know, the Zoom meetings, uh, some of them that I've attended, I've actually been more widely attended and actually really good. So I, you know, at this point, I would, in terms of experimenting, experiment more with trying to make the uh, the Zoom meetings more effective and broader. Because I mean, just the practical matter is whether it's an IETF meeting, an IGF meeting, an RSA meeting, people are running around like crazy busy, and they will say, "Yeah, I'll be there," and then something happens, and they don't make it. So finding time for the virtual again, I think that the experimentation is great, but let's just try it. But maybe offline we can talk about you know how many people actually were there and why we're doing RSA. So. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And and thanks for the update and thanks for the efforts in in doing this um, more um, perhaps more more focused to to the community. My comments are somehow focused on what Robert said, but I, I was wondering if you have thought about some regional perspective about meetings. Apart from the fact that IETF and ICA meetings uh, do exist and, and many companies and organization members do participate in these meetings, there are other organizational members, perhaps not so big as a big, big companies, but smaller from some regions. And maybe you could gather some of them at uh, regional IGFs or some regional meetings that may, may be interesting for those at a, at a regional level. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry to have turned my focus away from you. I wanted to invite uh, Anita to come up and, and speak to that. We have actually talked about that. 
Um, we didn't talk about it in, in the OMAC meeting too much. She briefly mentioned it in response to a question during the OMAC meeting. Um, so I feel I want to be a little cautious about calling this an, an OMAC thing. But in fact, Anita has been talking to us about uh, some options here, and I'll let her speak to that. Sure. So um, one of the one of the elements of this new strategic partnership um, approach that we're we're taking, um, one of the facets of that is looking at ways in which we can serve organization members that aren't able to attend global events like ICANN, IGF, IETF. So we're looking at hosting some regional events, working with the bureaus to identify members and also issues relating to policy and technology that are more regionally focused. So, and I think you and I had a chance to talk about it at ICANN, but this is what we're trying to do to, to achieve some, some community efforts, but at the regional level, because globally we don't always look at what are the, the issues impacting the region. So it's a strategic initiative on, on our part to work with the regions to identify, firstly, what are the issues there is there a need to have a gathering of organization members uh, to address some of these issues. So that, that's definitely in the plan for next year to, to look at and start to identify opportunities. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I mean, like the point Pepper was making, I mean, I was thinking exactly the same. Even, even if, if you make it to the meeting during an ITF, you know, people don't have time to prepare. They are maybe, you know, with their mind somewhere else. So, yeah, I mean, at least for me, I, I fully agree that it would work better just to have a, you know, at, at a random time, you know, not necessarily collocated with anything, um, you know, a meeting like that. So, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's good that we, we just... Um, experiment and see what works and what doesn't. Um, one thing that I would like to mention is that something that is kind of like, maybe we need a cognitive shift here. And, and Andrew has been talking about that. We've been discussing with, with Richard a lot as well, which is that maybe in the past, we've been looking into like ISOC and then, you know, like chapters, organizations, while, while, well, Andrew has described this many times. Maybe we should look at the community. So ISOC is really, the whole thing, and, and it happens that, you know, there's like, you know, different, let's say, sub-communities, but, you know, not looking at kind of completely separate things, like this is orgs, this is chapters, this is staff, this is the board. So maybe, you know, working along those lines, I think, you know, we could get people to get more engaged, or at least look at the engagement in a, in a different way. So, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there and see, see where it takes us. Yeah, I just want to add, I, I mean, I was thankful to Anita having spent some time with her during the ICANN meeting, actually, um, and then she first started talking about this idea of how do we reach other organizations, you know, people who don't come to global events, and she's got some ideas about specific ways in which to hold workshops that are more regionally focused, and so, you know, we, we she's asked for what what is the relationship between doing that and, and the OMAC in particular? Um, and so we're still trying to sort out what that really means, but we definitely want to provide an opportunity to reach more organizations and more organization members and more regionally focused instead of globally focused meetings is one way to do that. And we just haven't figured out yet how to action that. Um, Andrew? Uh, thanks. So one of the things here is that um, more generally, we've... Um, we don't exactly provide a lot of benefit to members uh, as things stand, right? But the value to being a member, being an organization member, whatever, is perhaps a little obscure. Uh, and um, uh, we would like to fix that. So I think Anita um, and the rest of the team have a number of ideas about how to, how to improve that, how to make the engagement happen. Uh, you, you know, I mean, many of you have heard me say this before, so I don't think it's any secret. Uh, I think that um, the internet and the industry that's sort of clustered around it has a number of challenges that actually can only be solved in a, a sort of collaborative effort. Uh, and, and some of that collaboration has to come from large industrial players in, in the industry, right? There's no there's no getting around the fact that very large companies have um, uh, a certain amount of influence in, in what can and can't be done. And we ought to be able to provide a, a forum and a, um, a community in which companies can work together on those things. Because if any one of those companies, you know, sort of makes a statement, even if it's a good one, even if it's a practical and, and positive uh, suggestion for the way the internet um, should should develop, 
th those those suggestions are often dismissed, you know, sort of in the political realm because oh well, it's just self-interest and so on. Um, and uh, and we've we've actually seen this on more than one occasion, right? Where companies suggest, well, we need to do um, this or that thing, and the result is that um, uh, and the result is that people say, no, that must be bad because so and so is proposing it, even if it's a good idea. So. So the internet society actually provides uh, a, a mechanism by which we can deliver that positive you know, outcome, I think, for the internet. Uh, and it provides a way in which the, the companies through the organizational members could, could in, in fact undertake that kind of collaboration. Uh, and if we think about you know, some other societies that have been set up along these lines, um, you know, th this is not a weird thing. Uh, Richard was pointing out to me uh, offline um, the other day that the Royal Society kind of works this way. I don't know that we're quite that exalted, but um, <laughs> uh, but but you know there are other uh, other things that I can think of. Various industry consortia kind of work this way. Uh, the DNS um, OARC uh, kind of works this way. It has this um, this sort of mechanism. Uh, that doesn't mean we're a trade association, of course, right? We're not Aaron, um, but we have. Um, we have some of these kind, different kinds of influences, and if we can stitch them together in a useful way, then that becomes the obvious benefit that we're providing to those kinds of members, and that's the reason that I'm, I'm, you know, positive about um, these kinds of developments. I think it's the right way to go. I think it's a way for us to develop our our various communities um, correctly, and it provides us also a model for how we can engage with individual members uh, a little more, because it's also true that our individual members are, you know, perhaps wondering what precisely they get for their checkbox on the website. Um, and so, you know, over time, I think that, that we can see that it's not something that you can, you can do overnight. You can't, you can't build these kinds of things overnight. People won't show up the first day. But if we get one or two victories under our belt, then, you know, it, it, it sort of creates a virtuous circle and, and we move forward that way. So that's, I think this is a, a, a you know, obviously a positive development. And I think that Anita and that whole, whole team at, at uh, the Internet Society are, are setting us up for good success there. Pepper. I com completely agree. I think we should also be very opportunistic. It's not as though there's a separate OMAC. Right? It's actually Internet Society members. Uh, and we should operate. So, a, and it's, so it's not necessarily, even necessarily a separate program or thing. I mean, I'm just trying to think for maybe I, because I've been spending too much time um, uh, worrying about uh, what's going on in Dubai, but you know, you were there, Andrew, we had a great um, ISOC reception. Um, uh, you know, that was not an OMAC event, but reaching out to all of the OMAC members who were there in Dubai, it would have been useful to actually do a wrapper around something that we were already doing as not a separate OMAC event that requires OMAC the people focused on their day job, you know, and the Bernita to you have been there, but rather with the with the staff, the the ISOC people who are there already doing things, but then to actually reach out to OMAC members saying, Oh, you're here, there's gonna be like let's get together, right? Um, and then pulling in, you know, Sally's team on the policy side, um, real value. Of, I mean, it's exactly what you're talking about. Those, I mean, the reason we're here is we, because we care about the future of the internet. There are issues, and again, it's not about lobbying, um, but it's using ISOC um, as an opportunity. I mean, there, right now there are informal um, working groups in Dubai of internet companies broadly that act all, who are all OMAC members, but it's not. You know, there's it, it, it had to be done separately. Where this is something that, you know, could be done also um, as part of ISOC helping orchestrate that and just getting people together. That is real value, right? But because it's not labeled as that, or it's, there's no wrapper around it, the companies that are the members that are there don't see, necessarily see it as an ISOC value add. Um, but I think it actually could be. And so, again, it's not OMAC as separate, but it's the organizational members that are part of the ISOC family. And we should just, and then, so for example, in things like that, it would be Sally's team that would actually be leading. Um, it's not a separate 
OMAC thing, but then feed back into Anita and what you're doing. I, just a suggestion. Anita. Just to answer or to address the, your, your suggestion, um, we're actually starting to do that. So whenever we have an IEGF or a Plenipot, um, IETF, we generate a list of who the organization members who are going to be there. And if I'm not going to be there or if Joyce is not going to be there representing membership and community engagement, we share that list. We're starting to share those lists with the staff that are going to be there. So for Plenipot, for example, we did share a listing of all the organization members who are going to be there because we needed some membership ambassadors who are going to be on the ground. And some of those were from Raul's team and some were from Sally's team. But um, it's just an extension of our, of our overall holistic approach to managing the members and engaging the members. So we are starting to share who those members are so that when the staff are on the ground, they know who's there. And even if it's just a thank you for supporting the Internet Society, it's part of our, our all-encompassing approach to engaging with the members, even if myself or Joyce can't be there in person. Okay, good. Um, well, I think this was a good discussion and definitely we need to continue following up because, yeah, there's a lot of interest in, in seeing OMAC basically, you know, take off and, and, you know, do more things. So, yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. Anything else, Jim? Just one closing comment, if I may. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to thank Anita uh, and, and the team. Uh, it, it really has been uh, a, a good experience in, in getting this started. I mean, I, I took on this role just in time, literally, for the, for the July meeting. And, and we've been figuring it out as we go here. And I just wanted to um, acknowledge that, you know, the team has been reaching out, uh, Anita in particular, to us. And I did want to thank her and give her credit for that and make sure that the board was, was aware of all of that. So thank Excellent. you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. Perfect. So moving along, we are three minutes ahead of schedule, so we are doing very well regarding timing. So we're going to be breaking for 18 minutes. So we will be back in 18 minutes. Thank you. Okay, so we are resuming the meeting at this point. Um, are we online again? Okay, good. Um, so Shiva, can, I, can you hear me? Shiva, hello. Uh, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now it works. Perfect. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, good. And, uh, so, so yeah, so Shiva is, is going to give us a report from the, from the Chapters Advisory Board. And, uh, and, you know, Richard couldn't join either, so, so Siva will take care of the presentation. So, yeah, go ahead, please. Thanks um, thank you, and uh, thank, uh, thanks to all the Board of Trustees for uh, uh, inviting us to make a presentation. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Richard could not join, Ali Olivier could not join either, so I'll be making the presentation. It's a very brief presentation focused more on some of the uh, chapter AC improvements and on some of the charter changes that we propose. Uh, Kevin, if you could move on to the next slide. We have, uh, at the last Board of Trustees meeting, one of the points that uh, came up was uh, what improvements are contemplated on the chapter AC working. We, are just, we have been discussing various improvements and some improvements are ongoing. Uh, for example, uh, Chapter SC is to identify new ways to choose topics that are of interest to the wider chapter community. So uh, it's not that we want to bring up topics on our own, but uh, uh, raise, uh, get members to introduce topics of interest and uh, that is of interest to the wider community and then have limited number of topics on each call and uh, also explore the option of uh, simulating various models for more effective uh, chapter AC meetings. Next slide, uh, Kevin. I'll just rush through some of the first slides. And other, uh, of course, as I men mentioned, uh, we are discussing a new version of uh, the charter. And one of the things that uh, we are still discussing is to ask if uh, the term for uh, the chapter AC, SC members could be extended from one year to two years for more effectiveness for the future SC teams. And uh, one of the important points that we want to highlight is that uh, when the quorum was set for uh, chapter AC meetings, the wider chapter AC meetings, it was set as 19 members, but for uh, 
the chapter sc which uh, comprises a total of nine members the quorum is set at nine almost the quorum is a super majority also uh, sorry uh, the quorum for the size of nine is seven so seven is too high a number so that we want to pay attention and bring it down next slide kevin and uh, one of the when it comes to engagement with members we notice that uh, of the global members of uh, members with isoc only about 45% of the individual members have opted to join chapters so some efforts are needed to encourage everyone to join chapters and already staff uh, are in the process of uh, developing a plan whereby uh, individual members will be encouraged to become chapter members and uh, other minor improvements such as using various other media for uh, better effectiveness apart from mail uh, for example whatsapp and so on and uh, one more important thing is that uh, to make chapter leaders understand the role of chapter ac we will have to communicate uh, about the work and role of the chapter ac to all chapters and so we'll do this uh, shortly next slide kevin uh, okay and um, our members uh, chapter ac sc members uh, to participate uh, wherever possible whenever feasible in regional activities and events and so we'll have to work on the metrics uh, for all this and next slide uh, kevin uh richard had a meeting with uh, uh, richard and olivia had a meeting with uh, the ceo at um, barcelona i was uh, late at barcelona so uh, various matters uh, were discussed and uh, the interaction with the ceo was quite encouraging and he was uh, quite receptive uh, to the work of the chapter ac and one of the suggestions that came up is that uh, uh when it comes to placing documents or interactions with the board chapter ac will work first with uh, staff and uh, uh, only when absolutely needed uh, send recommendations directly to the board and uh, uh, also at this juncture juncture i want to make a suggestion that uh, we will we will have a face to face meeting with the board if possible at least once during a year it's a suggestion next slide kevin and in this meeting we are bringing uh, three topics one is uh, uh, the broader topic of uh, making chapters better known nationally locally and uh, to help uh, make chapters better trusted as a source of policy advice this was also raised in the last meeting and uh, uh, and also also create a database of all isoc uh, activities uh, carried out by isoc global both uh, those activities that are uh, done in collaboration with chapters and uh, those that are not so that uh, chapters have a much better understanding and get uh, better involved in the work of isoc and uh, so next slide kevin okay this is the focus of this meeting um, we have uh, looked at uh, the charter and uh, the charter was uh, drafted uh, in 2015 and certain improvements are required um, mainly in the area of uh, improving communication within chapters and within staff and board and uh, uh, to improve the participation of chapters and to broaden discussions and next slide kevin kevin okay okay one of the okay uh, next slide I'll go to the right next slide okay one of the clauses in uh, the charter or uh, in the rules of procedure says that uh, if a chapter does not appoint a delegate then the chapter 
chair shall become the delegate of the chapter ac i mean to make it an autom automatic process uh, for chapters to be represented in the ac right now we are waiting for uh, each chapter to designate a chapter uh, representative to the chapter ac whereas uh, the current proposal is to consider the chapter president as the default representative and uh, if uh, for some reason the chapter president does not uh, have time to take part in the chapter ac activities then the process of appointing a delegate uh, uh, is required so uh, right now it is un it is unnecessary to wait for um, the ch chapter to formally say that uh, the chapter uh, president will be the delegate or uh, an alternate delegate has to be appointed so because of uh, the present uh, clause uh, we have um, uh, many chapters still not represented in the chapter ac i think this bylaw change will uh, get uh, all chapters engaged and uh, it will increase participation in the work of the chapter ac and then uh, bylaw section 5.4 uh, there is a reference uh, that uh, the election of the chapter ac members will be concluded at the annual meeting uh, which is again a redundant process because uh, uh, the election results uh, confirm that uh, they have already become formal members of the chapter ac so we have uh, proposed to um, uh, delete this uh, reference to unconcluded at annual meeting and there is a section 7 which uh, is now much better worded in our proposal next slide uh, kevin okay this concerns operation and uh, these are the various um, uh, this is the text of the changes there is one is about uh, conducting business by correspondence which which is what we do we uh, seldom meet face to face and so the emphasis is placed on doing business by correspondence and uh, class 7.2 now says that uh, any member of the chapter ac may propose a topic for discussion right now uh, topics are brought up by the sc and uh, uh, now the uh, suggested changes to involve all chapter ac members or in effect all chapters to propose a topic for discussion and uh, um, the chapter ac sc chair will moderate moderate the discussion and will try to find a solution and uh, um, then 7.3 is about the consensus process uh, uh, we will normally look for consensus and uh, um, the member could also request the chair uh, of the chapter ac for a formal consensus call when there are no formal objections during the consensus call the proposal is deemed adopted and um, the proposal will be transmitted to the board for its consideration next slide kevin in case it does not achieve consensus uh, that is if there is a formal objection then the steering committee will request the chair to initiate a formal vote if the proposal is then approved by the voting process uh, by the required um, majority then again the chair of the chapter ac will transmit the proposal to the board for consideration and the next clause talks about meeting twice a year and uh, improving input uh, process from chapters on specific issues and so on <coughs> here here again we have talked about the chapters uh, having the opportunity to propose topics and um, the rationale is to facilitate discussions by correspondence the overall rationale is to uh, make the bylaw suit uh, the uh, practical way by which we work uh, more by correspondence and uh, we'll work with uh, staff to find a solution on topics and um, 
at a final stage will transmit to the board. Next slide, Kevin. And the, there is another important section. So uh, we are at a formative stage and uh, it is just uh, the foundations are still being laid and uh, the bylaw uh, or, and the charter uh, require some finer adjustments from time to time. And um, the section 10 was a little complicated. It laid down a very complex process uh, uh, which is difficult for the chapter AC to go through. And uh, it is needlessly, needlessly complicated. So we, we've simplified the section 10 on charter changes by saying that uh, subject to the final approval by the board of trustees. The emphasis is placed on approval by the board of trustees rather than on on a very elaborate uh, process. So, uh, subject to the approval of the ISAC board of trustees, the charter may be amended amended by the charter advisory council. So, this is to simplify the amendment process. Next slide, Kevin. So, we are seeking the board approval for these changes. Next slide, Kevin. Okay, and, and, and on improvements, this is the last slide. And, and on improvements, we are trying to identify new ways to choose topics and uh, as already mentioned, have less topics and uh, uh, the models. And uh, uh, we, we are uh, looking at other ways of uh, increasing. These are all again covered in the previous slide. And uh, um, one important thing is that uh, we are uh, using a chapter SC list for communication within the chapter SC and then there is a larger chapter delegates list which can which uh, includes about 900 participants but in between uh, if we are looking at uh, chapter AC representatives that is the chapter presidents and the, uh, or the designated representative to the chapter AC from chapters that should be a list of about 100 uh, people and so we will also use that list as well and so these are uh, in brief the various improvements that uh, we would like to present to the board and uh, we in particular would like to place uh, the charter improvement proposal for the board's uh, approval and this is in brief and if there are any questions i would like to respond thank you very much thank you thank you very much siva for for the presentation um so we can maybe focus a bit on the proposal for changes um that that you you basically um explore here so the status from my end as far as i can tell is that i i received a, a preliminary copy or a copy of the proposal and i sent back some some comments um so i don't know if at this point which I mean, I, I didn't get any any responses to, but maybe the idea is to discuss them here. Um, I don't know if at this point you want to, you know, me to share the the proposal with the whole board. I, I guess you know I can share the document, but uh, but I think that you know just to to summarize the the preliminary comments I I made is like I mean I, I think some of the changes here are really good, and some of them are are less good. The the, the good change, for example, is the fact that, you know, the document acknowledges the, the fact that you guys will work with staff to begin with. And I think that will resolve a lot of issues that they don't require um, board time. So I think that would be a, a very good change. And, and, uh, and I think that's kind of, you know, the way things work in general. But I think it's good to formally capture that in, in this document. Um, the changes I, I didn't like so much, um, they, they relate to the way... Uh, quorum is defined and consensus is, is reached and, and assessed and defined. Because, I mean, as, as you know, we have been working first with Avery and with Richard, with Olivier, with you, on, on getting the, the chapter advisory um, council to be more active. So in that case, these, these changes of like, you know, lowering the bar to, you know, basically say that we have quorum, we have consensus, I don't think it's a step in the right direction as, as, I mean, as a matter of fact, it's actually a step in the wrong direction because we will be basically hiding the problem. We will be saying that, yeah, we have quorum. We will be saying that, yeah, sure, we have an active council. While I think the right thing to do would be to basically try to increase the engagement. We, we had the same issue with, 
with we were discussing with Jim like half an hour ago with the with the organizational group. So I, I think all our efforts should be directed into you know increasing the engagement rather than saying well since we cannot get you know more than three guys to involve you know to engage we will just you know declare victory. Um, so that yeah. part I I think it requires a bit more um, discussion. Then there were. Uh, if, I yes, could respond, uh, if I could respond, yeah. it's easier for me to respond point by point. Uh, there are certain realities that we've taken into consideration. First of all, they are all volunteers, uh, both uh, the chapter delegates as well as uh, chapter leaders and uh, um, the chapter AC, uh, SC representatives. And uh, when it comes to attending a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting, for example, like uh, in Panama or in Barcelona, it depended on who was already traveling to that destination and out of uh, uh, nine chapter ACSC uh, representatives only four of us were there or five of us were there so even taking that as an extreme case in normal meetings a quorum to convene the meeting to convene the meeting and to consider the meeting as formal of seven out of nine that is almost a super majority a See super ma I, I wasn't talking about that 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 quorum i i agree that seven out okay. of ten is too much i was talking about quorum for for sending staff to the board as described in your slides so when you can decide that that request for example represents you know the the consensus of the chapters and and send it to the board so the whole point is to understand that this actually represents the consensus of the chapters not just like by one chapter or two chapters. So that's that's the point I was I was trying to make. The the super majority or, or the seven out of nine quorum, I, I fully agree that that's too much. Yes, that was the point that we are emphasizing. And we've also acknowledged that uh, even for the chapter AZ meetings, the quorum of 19 chapters out of a total of 100 is low. So I think uh, our thinking is that that quorum should be increased a little bit depending on how chapter participation builds up and then we are uh, slightly uh, we have to be a little more clear in our communication on the distinction between the quorum that uh, we talk about for the meetings and the and the quorum or the majority that we talks for uh, considering a proposal approved on that uh, particular majority requirement i would very much agree with you and then i'll take back uh, these uh, comments to the chapter ac and place it there for uh, uh, attention maybe include a, a sentence of clarity on that and i would uh, like to hear further comments and i'm sorry i uh, interrupted you just to um, uh, respond to all the points no i mean, it's good, I, I i appreciate the fact that you want to, to respond point by point um, so I, I think any step in the direction that we, we get active participants as opposed to just, you know, passive participants would be good. That's why I was reacting as well to the fact that, that we are defining a default of like, you would be the representative of your chapter in the chapter advisory board. If, if they don't appoint anyone would be by default the chair. But my thinking is that if a chapter doesn't even bother to send an email saying, yeah, we are appointing the chair or something. I mean, I think it's like, I mean, the engagement is as low as it gets. So, so if you could explain what's the rationale to make that default, that would be really good. There is a combination of factors. The problem is not, not just lack of interest that would be jumping to a conclusion that the problem is more of uh, communications and the way we communicate and the, uh, Right now, the only method of communication to chapters is by email. And so one of the proposals is to include, include various media just to make sure that uh, any message or communication from the staff or uh, chapter AC gets across to the chapters, which would uh, highlight uh, the importance of participation, the importance of designating a representative, for instance. And until such time, uh, the proposal is to since the chapter president is uh, an elected uh, representative of the chapter, by default, uh, he could be considered included in the chapter AC. Until 
for another two or three years later when probably the communications are improved and various uh, methods of communication with the chapters are improved this is just a thought we are open to suggestions the chapter is you will be open to suggestions on that yeah i mean probably we, we need to discuss more of this because i what i don't understand is that if you cannot communicate with that person i mean if you cannot get basically a yes i'm, I'm appointing myself or appointing someone i mean any further communication is going to be impossible. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably missing something that you are trying to resolve and I, I just don't understand. So, um, I mean, but again, I mean, th these are my preliminary comments when I got the draft and I, I wouldn't like to kind of dwell on that because it's not really the board view. It's, I mean, we haven't even discussed that. It was just like the things that based on our goals with the chapter advisory board, I thought it was kind of, you know, um, you know low hanging fruit, so to speak. So I, I think the next step is that I will share your document with, with the whole board or, or Kevin can do that or well, somebody will do and, uh, and then, you know, gather more comments and then establish a, a communication. Maybe we need a conference call at, that point, at some point or maybe we need to, to meet with, with you guys and, and, you know, Richard, Olivier, yourself or, or you know, we will see how, how to conduct this. But I, I think, you know, like a constructive communication would be good because I agree that, you know, fixing the, the document and reflecting current realities would be quite useful. Um, I don't know if we have any more comments from, I, I know that you chapter people in the board, they are familiar with this and probably have been following the, the like I, I'm looking at Glenn, Hans-Peter, Olga, I mean all of you. So, any any comments? Yeah, Olga. <coughs> I, I agree with you that, that the chapter should read and understand all the communications that, but sometimes to some chapters, it may be difficult to follow, but you have several lists that come and, and usually what happens is that few people are the one following all the lists, that that's the reality because it's volunteer work and that becomes uh, complicated. So in a way, I see value in appointing by default the chair because the chair in general is the one kind of looking at the whole activity of the chapter and the relationship with the organization. But I share your, your concern that, that there's a, I think there's a lack of understanding, not, not perhaps communication, understanding which is the role of the chapter advisory committee and its role in relation with the board and with the, with the staff. And I see value also in this change in, in directing the, the staff things to the staff and, and the board things. I, I see, but, but there's work to be done there. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Yeah, I, I know that some of you are, are more familiar with this. So that's what I mean, like a, a more kind of better discussion with the document in front of us would be more useful. Hans Peter. Yes, I believe we have to see the whole document and, and to, to see the changes in uh, their environment to, to really understand it and really to react it. And picking just one point again, uh, which is the default uh, position of a chapter president as representative in the AC, I think it might be okay to propose a default, but it should be actively acknowledged. As long as a chapter is not even actively acknowledging that they are part uh, in the AC, it doesn't make sense to me. That's, that's my first reaction. Later, if I see more text. Yeah, okay. yeah I mean, has Peter captured much better than what I was articulating, my, my point, I, I, I'm not against anyone performing this. It's just like if someone doesn't, I mean, you cannot even get an email back saying, okay, then it's difficult to understand that that's a, a step in the right direction. Anyway, um, then as next steps, I will um, circle the document and we can continue this discussion, which as I said, I, I think it's, everybody would agree is very important. Um, Siva, anything else from your end? Uh, no, uh, your comments are quite valid and the observations from Olga and Hans Peter as well. I'll take this all to the chapter uh, SC and then uh, we will, as you have proposed, uh, continue communicating with you and discussing with you on this before we formally place it for the board approval. Okay, thank you, Siba. And um, before, before you hang up, um, something I didn't address that you were proposing to meet with the, with the board, either on the phone or face-to-face. -face. I mean, we will be more than happy to meet with you guys. Regarding face-to-face -face meetings, there's a few groups that they are always kind of, you know, meeting with us or requesting to meet with us. The current policy we follow is that we first look at the agenda and when we have an agenda which is kind of, you know, full enough or, or it's clear that the, it has topics that require 
or would benefit from face-to-face -face discussions, then we, we schedule face-to-face -face meetings. When things can you know, be dealt with by, by phone or video conference, we usually prefer that. Even some, some of our own meetings, like the monthly meeting, some board meetings even, they are conducted over teleconference, so that's kind of the, the current view. But, uh, but if needed, absolutely, we are open to, to anything, including a face-to-face -face meeting when needed. Okay, thank you, know. Siva. Thanks for, for your presentation. Know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. So um, the next step in the agenda is um, point number eight. Um, and Raul is the driver. So Raul is going to um, talk about the chapter charter um, process document. So Raul, can you hear us? Yes. <clears throat> yes, uh, Gonzalo. Uh, good, good morning for you. This uh, is one uh, one twenty eight here. The uh, wait for you. I'm, I'm hold on a second, Raúl. Just one second. Yeah. Yes, no problem. Okay, yeah. We, no, I, I was consulting a, a second with John. So, Raul, please, the, the floor is yours. And, and if you guys could increase a bit Raul's volume in the room, that would be perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Raul. Please go ahead. Okay, let me see if I can put on my video, but I think, no, it's not, it's not allowed. Okay, <clears throat> that's fine. Um, I, I already uh, um, sent to the, to the board the three uh, procedures that the, our staff uh, put together. In fact, the first one already existed and was uh, available in the in the website. That is the the, the, the process to to form a chapter. Uh, we didn't have formal uh, processes for uh, moving chapters uh, to rejuvenation and for the chartering uh, chapters. And we we thought that as part of all the process we have. And been following in the last couple of years with the formation of the chapter of Azure Council, with the implementation of the of the system for uh, the performance uh, evaluation system, with the uh, rollover of the uh, new chart, chapter letter. So this was uh, uh, another piece that uh, was lacking, and and the the team, the chapters engagement team, was uh, working on that. Um, and the, as you can see, there are very um, texts that is extracted from the chapter letters, and also pieces that are aligned and extracted uh, from the from the ISOC bylaws. It has been reviewed by the chapter advisory council, the steering committee, and by our legal counsel. And basically, we didn't have any object, objection. I'm not hearing you. That's uh, it's, it's because nobody is speaking. Or? Yeah, yeah. I, I was okay. checking if there's some comments in the room. Um, any? Yeah. I mean, you received all the documents that Raúl was talking about. Um, I think Desire had some comments, but it wasn't on this particular document. So, so, so to be clear, we we don't have to approve this. Um, it's just to record that you know the board accepts this, so it's just acknowledging that we we received them. So having no comments is, is completely fine, but but I, I would appreciate if somebody would make eye contact with me and say, this is okay or something. Okay, <laughs> now I'm much happier. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, Richard. No, I, I reviewed these documents that look very well put together and very sensible. I would like to thank the team for their work on, on you know, continuing to improve this process. Okay, good, thank you. Um, okay, so Raul, uh, oh, well, Walid, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to add uh, my support to this effort, and it's good to have something documented as follow-up uh, feature. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, Raúl, um, do you know anything else from us at this point? No, just uh, I think that you say that uh, the CDA had a, a comment, but um, just uh, to add some uh, information that uh, so we. We, in fact, we have not moved so far in a chapter to, uh, we have not the charter chap, uh, chapter so far, 
uh, only chapters that have dissolved themselves. And uh, now, probably now that we are being much more formal in the world with the chapters, and there are a, a few chapters that are dormant, and, and we have moved them to rejuvenation. Some of them will make it. Um, some of them probably uh, will not make it, and will be the, the first cases that uh, in which we will use the the processes that we have that we have put in front of you now. Okay, good. Um, any any follow up, Desiree? Or... Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm fine with these documents. I have a, a comment on the other document that we're not discussing here. So I don't know when's the appropriate time to bring that one up. Okay. Well, I mean, we, the, the thing is like, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit concerned as well because Raul is a, in a difficult time, time zone, so I don't want him like to be awake the whole night. Uh, we could discuss it in AOP at some point. Um, otherwise, we could discuss it with him next week in, in, a, in a, you know, a call about this actually. Yes, it has to do with the MOU that um, some um, 17 chapters have not signed yet and okay. that the proposed text of MOU is not acceptable for all chapters. So I wouldn't like to have this uh, um, template adopted and uh, because there, there's some concerns, different chapters. I cannot speak on behalf of any chapters. I'm speaking on behalf of the UK chapter. Okay. And uh, oh, oh, what we have seen is a difficulty to sign a particular article within that chapter. And we think if, uh, you know, the source is good for one goose, then it's good for the geese as well. Um, so I would think that we can discuss this, how to amend it, that it worked for all chapters. Okay. I mean, we have five minutes now. You want... Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to comment on that. Summarize quickly or? Uh, certainly. Um, uh, yeah. For the UK chapter in particular, there's a problem to sign the current text of the Article uh, 10 because it's uh, dealing uh, um, with the notion that the ISO Global can unilaterally torn an agreement with a chapter and, um, uh, um, and for the UK directors of a, a limited company it's difficult to uh, accept an agreement in that form. Um, so what we have proposed is a different text asking for a 90 days notice and also uh, for uh, communication with the chapters. So what we'd like to have is just a um, dual process, um, and, but there could be other, um, I would say improvements we can do to this document, for example, the place of arbitration and so on. Um, so there, there, th this is really uh, what I like to see, and I don't know how many other chapters might have looked into this issue that have signed it. I know we're on a deadline here, um, but it's very minimalistic, and, and this text uh, would just get us over the line. But I think there's a lot of um, other improvements that um, could be looked into, and I, I'd like to thank Joyce and Nick Hirka, who have been in touch with the um, chapter over this change. Um, but I think the board should be aware of, of, of this issue. Thank you, Desiree. Hans Peter wants to elaborate on that, maybe? Yeah, just to support uh, what Desiree uh, just uh, brought forward. We have the same problem uh, with the same article. We have another problem uh, with uh, a different naming of a chapter. And we decided to uh, propose to sign the MOU with an accompanying letter uh, dealing on these things. And it's uh, letting, uh, sitting on the desk of our chapter president at the moment to be signed and to be sent back. And it's still some room for improvement in the uh, proposed boilerplate text, which would make it easier, I think, for the last group of chapters to sign. Um, this year, right? Yes, I think it, it's important to say it's not that the chapter says what ISOC intends to do is a bad thing. It's just there has this potentiality of being seen as um, being threatening to the bylaws of the chapter itself in the country where it serves. Okay. Um, yeah, as, as next step, because I mean, we don't have so much time now. Um, um, uh, Gonzalo, may I have yeah. 30 seconds? Yeah, of course, Raul. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
it's uh, we have already as a as i report to you um 86 percent of the chapters already signed the the the, the new uh, charter and the the new charter is is, is not uh, something that was produced by the staff um, and it was uh, uh, uh something that was uh, developed along one year of open consultations and discussion with the chapter advisory and council uh, with its uh, steering committee and there were a lot of opportunities to make comments we tried to address or as much comments as possible and we got to a final piece of uh, uh, that's uh, that was a kind of uh, agreement and uh, that's in, in fact as i say probably there will be uh, three four chapters that will not be able to sign because they are really dormant and uh, that so they they will not be ready to sign the this uh, before the end of the year and uh, we know that there are three four uh, chapters that uh, have some problems specifically with the this uh, sentence that that the city mentioned that's the, um, I'm very optimistic that we can address this uh, through a clarification of, the, of our intentions, formal clarification to the Chapter Advisory Council. This is something we are discussing with our legal counsel now. Um, but the, so I, th I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that we will be, if we will not be 100% of chapters uh, signing it, it will be very close. And we have made uh, some, um, adjustment to the to the text uh, but uh, to in order to um, uh, adapt the text to the local the local legal framework in some cases and in this specific case i think that i am putting the text in the in the in the in the chat the the text of the this clause the sentence that uh, the city mentioned and that's i think that we see that as a as a way that we are not imposing the change but uh, we are asking for the acceptance of, of the changes. And I think that, that so it's, it's not in any way we try to, in fact, it would not be feasible. And that's, this is why we have the chapter of advisory council and other bodies that uh, would not allow that to happen. But uh, um, it's not the intention to impose anything to the chapters. We have not done that, never done. That's not, it's not the idea. But I think that we can clarify that and I'm very optimistic that, that we can uh, solve the issue. Thank you, Raul. And everybody can read on the screen the, the text that Raul was um, sharing. So, okay. Um, I think, well, um, I guess there's this, this a way to follow this up. Um, so, so I see the Syrian has been already engaged in the discussion. So if, if you guys keep us updated and, and if we need to discuss this at any point, we can include it in an agenda, that would be great. So that at least we know what's going on and uh, yeah, okay. Perfect. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you, Hans, Peter, and, and Raúl. Anything else from from your end? No, sir. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raúl. Okay. Um, so we are moving on to the next um, point in the agenda, which is, um, you know, point number nine, actually. So we're gonna have the our yeah, Middle East Bureau. And as you know, I mean, we have been meeting all the all the bureaus that we have, and and I always say that, but I mean that that's a, a part of the of the presentation that that the board actually enjoys, and that's why we we started inviting the you know regional bureau every time we we go around the world. So um, we are looking forward to to seeing this presentation as soon as the mic is fixed. <laughs> so uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for inviting us to present to you. Uh, I think, should, should we stay here? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Seth has to follow you with the camera, so I don't ah. know how agile <laughs> he is. <laughs> I start dancing. So the team is really excited to present to you. Next slide, please. So we'll give you a background about the region, uh, who we are, and what our ma major accomplishments were the last two years. We'll give you the policy constraints that we work within in the region, and then we present to you our activity plan for 2019. Next slide, please. So uh, I am Salam Yamut, and uh, I'm a computer engineer, and I'm the regional bureau director. The policy advisor is Nermin Al Saadani. She is an economist and a political scientist with 28 years of experience with the government of Egypt 
and the community manager is Leal Gibran. She's an architect and an entrepreneur, and uh, she'll be taking care of all the, our community involvement. And yes, we are three women, and no, we didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> We just recruited the best talent. It happens to be the three girls. So, and by the way, it's working great. The team dynamic is fantastic. But we are still uh, gonna hire two people, a technology advisor and communication. So pray for us that there will be some diversity. Next slide, please. So uh, we're gonna start with a geography lesson or whatever, because a lot of people have told us that nobody knows a lot about the Middle East. So. Middle East first, the name is a problem because some people call it Arab states, some people call it MENA, Middle East, North Africa. Some people put Turkey and Iran with it. Some people take Turkey and Iran. So from our perspective, since we happen to be three Arab girls, so the Middle East could be divided to three sub-regions. The first sub-region is the GCC Gulf um, countries, which, sorry, uh, these. So this is Saudi Arabia. Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Yemen. These are the old producing countries. These are the rich countries. They score well on most indexes, international indexes of prosperity, a very high GDP per capita, very high internet penetration, etc. And then you have the Levant and North Africa, and these are like Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and then we continue uh, Egypt, Libya, uh, Tunis, Algeria, and Morocco. Okay, so these countries where they have high education levels, they have economic problems because they're non-oil producing country, and you'll see that they are, will vary uh, in, the, in the level of prosperity. And uh, finally, you have the war-torn countries that happen to be everywhere. So uh, Palestine, and Lebanon is recovering, Iraq, Syria, for sure, Yemen, Libya. So uh, the whole, to tell you the, um, to, to make a long story short, the whole region is under a tremendous economic and political stress, okay? So they all speak Arabic, but we'll talk about it later. Yeah, next slide, please. So yeah, 240 million people speak Arabic. Unfortunately, they're not, um, really collaborating and we see this within the same country, within the same agency and within the region. There is no culture of collaboration and sharing. Some numbers for you to understand a little bit the context, I'll start from here. 25% female labor uh, force participation. This is the lowest in the world. 60% youth under 25 uh, years of age. This is the youngest region in the world. We like best or worse, right? So we're either <laughs> 70 percent of people are on social media. This is one of the top five in the world again. 310 million views on YouTube alone, that's number two in the world. So what does that tell you? That tells you that yes, the people are using the internet. We're not sure they're using the internet for creating jobs or for education, but they are consumers of the technology and not producers of it. Next slide, please. More numbers, 85% of local traffic is routed through Europe. It's cheaper to go from Kuwait to London to UAE than to go from Bahrain to UAE, okay? And that's why you'll see later we are concentrating on IXPs as one of the things. 56.4% is the average internet penetration. This is a good number, but again, you have to remember the three sub-regions. So this number varies from 12% in Yemen to 100% uh, and 100 plus percent in Kuwait and in Bahrain in the GCC countries. These two numbers are very interest, in, interesting. They tell me seven to 18% of, of private sector companies are online. This, this, is, this, is, this is bad, right? So private sector is not even a stakeholder, right? And 1% of the e-commerce volume only of all the GDP and everything, that also shows you that besides all producing, we're, we're not there yet. And these two numbers, this is this is number according to McKinsey, 1%. So who are the stakeholders in the Middle East? The private sector, obviously, from this slide is not present. Next slide, please. So given 
this uh, introduction, the Middle East Bureau early on decided to have a three-pong strategy and three-pong approach. On the one hand, we know we need to engage all stakeholders, okay? So, and mainly the governments, for reason you will understand even more with Nermin's presentation, this is very high top on our agenda. Our second thing that is very high top on our agenda is building the community of internet stakeholders. As I said, there's no private sector, but I will tell you more, there's no civil society neither. So we are here as a team trying to rally the troops, right? We're trying to build the community and bringing it together at the same time. We're gonna concentrate on youth. And nobody knows internet society in the Middle East. What, who, who are you? Oh, is this the same as, and they give you another organization. Um, at best, they think it's a US centric uh, organization working for the US government. That's if they know something. So we're, we're working on, on, on our brand and our angle of approach is technology. We're using technology to engage with all, uh, with all groups. Next slide, please. Yes. <laughs> I guess the next slide is going to be our major accomplishments and I will, uh, I will ask my colleague Layal to, to take the floor. Thank you, Salam. So if we were in any of the Arab world right now, this would be uh, electricity outage, not technical. <laughs> Maybe ask some questions in the meantime, very quickly. Uh, just, just curious, because when you mention the Levant, because uh, I don't know the terminology, what does that mean? Is it, does it mean uh, that, you know, like uh, Jordan, Israel, yes. Yes. Uh, and all that. Is that what it means? Yes, the Levant is the um, the western part of Asia. Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Palestine, Iraq. I think that's it. We don't include Israel. No. Israel is actually a part of Europe. Not only in our classification, but I think there's some kind of international standard that uh, Israel is with Europe. Like if you watch Eurovision and whatever, Israel is part of. Which, which is a bit confusing for me. Uh, I'm, I'm from Singapore. So we, we have always looked from my perspective in, in Singapore, we have always looked all the way to Israel as being the end point of Asia. So if politically, if it is classified as Europe, then I had no idea. All right, so we're gonna be talking about our major accomplishments. Next slide, please. Um, in order to uh, engage our communities, we partnered up with local entities and international entities uh, represented locally, as you can see in this slide. Next slide, please. Um, also, as you can see, we've been keeping Andrew busy. We couldn't include all the photos of where he met with governments. Uh, however, we were meeting around the region in governments with uh, Jordan, uh, Oman, and um, uh, this is all the work of two years only of a bureau that's been around for two years only. We're, we're trying our best to engage as much as possible. Next slide, please. Um, so you see here four slides, most of them say IXP. Why IXP? Because we believe that in order to penetrate our, our region, we need, uh, we need to penetrate it using technology. IXP was the right hitting point for it. Um, as you can see, we created one in Lebanon. We were part of one in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Bahrain, and there was an intro to IETF in Jordan. Uh, our Bahrain IXP workshop uh, gathered 30, um, uh, 30 um, re regulators, sorry, 30 regulators, and um, uh, it was in collaboration with the ITU. And uh, they're actually coming over to Minox, so actually we go to them, they come to us, and this is what collaboration is about. We put ourselves out there, they now know who we are. Next slide, please. Um, we had our CEO meet with the with chapter uh, representatives from all over the GCC. Um, we uh, partnered at the Mayak SIG in Egypt, and uh, we created the booklet on enabling digital opportunities. This booklet was created with the help of the local communities in the region. We asked them, what are you suffering from? What do you need? What do you need us to handle? And what do you need us to present to the world? And this booklet was actually the, the, the result of, of those uh, answers. Yes, sir. 
So those are exactly the right questions to be asking. I'm glad you're engaging on this. What, what were the critical th issues that got raised in the, in the, that are covered in that booklet? Um, uh, women representation, youth uh, involvement in uh, digital economy, yes, <laughs> global content, education, local content, actually. Uh, we speak Arabic, but uh, we don't have any local content, so that was one of the major things. Um, and we had three blockchain workshops in Jordan, Lebanon, and UAE on the span of a whole week. We would like to thank Mr. Walid Sakka for uh, giving time from his personal time to create these workshops with us. And um, wh why we focus on blockchain? It's because we consider it an emerging technology in our region and it attracted a lot of people. We went in from having workshops that were 30 people to having workshops including 86 people. Over capacity, we were turning down people because the room would not fit anyone anymore. And these, these attendees were translated into members, so that was growth for us. And it's a growth metric and we're very proud of it. Next slide, please. Uh, our Middle East chapters are Bahrain, Lebanon, Palestine, UAE, and Yemen. Uh, we coordinate with the African Bureau on the Arabic-speaking countries such as Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia. And uh, in 2018, we focused on Jordan and Oman. Uh, we are currently in the process of starting new chapters there. We're talking with people and they are actively meeting. Um, our percentage of growth is 18% in one year, which is, I believe, is major for, for, for a bureau that's been here for two years. Um, and it's really important to focus on, on a fact that uh, two of the countries that are rated in our top chapters, uh, tier A chapters, are war-torn countries. They're Yemen and Palestine, and uh, th that is something to remember. Next slide. That's all. I will ask Nirmin, my colleague, to take it from here. Thanks, Layel, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm the policy guy over here, and I would like to start by posing a very simple question, and um, I hope that some of you will reflect on that. So January 2011, does that remind you or strike a bell about anything in the Middle East region? Yes? What? Yes, exactly. And this is a date that Arab governments will never forget. okay? Why is that? And if you can go to the next slide, Kevin, please. Why is that? Because this triggered so many uh, debate internally and externally as well with the international partners about what's going on region and, and how this evolved actually in, in countries like Egypt, for example, where stability <clears throat> was a matter of like de facto and no one really think or thought about a, a revolution as we have witnessed in 2011. In the, in the following slides, and there are only two, <clears throat> I will just shed some light on the key uh, challenges from a government perspective and then from our bureau perspective. And then we will see together how are we going to strike the balance between the, the bunch of challenges that we are saying. There are so many information behind these four blocks, but I will just start with the security. And to cut the story short, when government now discuss security in the region, they mean national security, okay? And they start to discuss among themselves about how ICT really impact the national security of the country. Why is that? Because simply the Arab Spring started from Facebook, if I may, not Facebook or other social platforms. And this raises so many concerns how ICT are being used or mal used by terrorists. And this is continuing to happen. And there are so many evidence in the region that terrorists, as well as we develop the use, using of the internet for very positive um, things, they are as well mal using it to communicate among themselves to execute their terrorist attacks and they recruit people via. Uh, unfortunately, social media and other platforms as well. So for government from the Arab countries, they believe that security is national security, and they seek, by the way, and this is extremely important, and a paradigm shift in the way they are thinking, they are seeking collaboration on the international and regional level. But do they know how to do that? No, the answer is no. And many, and many questions that maybe will be raised during our discussion, the answer will be no as well. They don't know how to do the thing, okay? so. Striking the balance between the positive impact of ICT and how this can impact the growth, uh, the GDP for the country, for the economic growth in general, and so on, has this, you know, like shadow on the other side on, on the terrorist attacks and cyber attacks and so on. And this leads me to the social media platforms that has organic growth in the region. We maybe have the highest 
penetration rate on, on the social media platforms in general. And uh, the youth are leading this, um, you know, like innovative platforms and so on, more than the governments. And, um, and still, the, the youth and the citizens believe that there are huge opportunities, for example, for the small and medium enterprises, the entrepreneurial world, where they can promote their jobs or their work on, on the, on, online and on Facebook and so on. While the government, when they have like a critical incident in some rural area in whatever country there is, the very simple thing that they do for, from the security perspective, they shut it down. And then we go for the paradox again and again between striking the balance between maintaining the internet and helping it to grow and at the same time maintaining the security of the country itself. And then we move to the unemployment. Maybe the region has the highest unemployment rate. I think it's maybe 40 plus or 30 plus percent, which is very high. And the female, um, I mean the gender, is very much um, an unprivileged in the region for from the unemployment rates. The youth as well is again another uh, major deficit in the in the region in that perspective. The internet provides what we call future of jobs, right? The new technology trends provides new techniques how to recruit people and how to make use of the youth and the um, energy of the youth and the passion to use the internet and new technologies while the government are still struggling backward how to regulate the internet, how to regulate new technologies, how to understand artificial intelligence. So all of these, you know, like four blocks are causing so many um, um, internal debates and the government are, the governments in general are struggling as well. And this is our role at, as an internet society organization to help them out. This is why if we go to the next slide, Kevin, please, you will see that I have put to engage the government as one of the very critical challenges. And why is that, if I may as well ask? It's always, you know, like <clears throat> from an international perspective, we always say we would like to have a bottom-up approach, right? When we do anything, we need to go to the community and the grassroots and so on and help them engage and then go up upwards. In the Arab region, you have to downwards. You have to go to the government, maybe to the leader of the country at some point in time, and when you have their blessings and when you have their belief in you, then they will have all the open doors for you as a strategy. It doesn't go the other way around. So we have to engage with the government, we have to convince the government, and I think Andrew has met some, some of them, and he uh, touched upon some of the challenges that we are facing and we will be facing, but we are brave enough, and I think we understand enough as well the region where we, I think we will inshallah achieve some success in that perspective. So when we engage the government, we will be able to build the community because until now, the technical community in the Arab region, I would say non-existing. I've been working with the government for long. We don't have cybersecurity stuff enough. We have about 20 people around and they are not really into security in the sense that I understand from the IETF and the fellows over there, okay? So we need to build really the, the technical community. We need to build then the technical know-how and we need to therefore to reintroduce internet society to the region in the sense that we are not associated to any other organization that they believe that it might be an enemy kind of and we are neutral uh, entity that would like to help. And by the end of 2019, we hope that we can, if you move to the other slide, Kevin, we need to strike the balance to that they memorize this slogan, open, globally connected, trustworthy, secure internet for everyone. Thank you. Nermin, next slide, please. So that brings us to what are we going to do next year? Next slide, please. So all our actions are going to be driven by two things. The one thing is what the region demands or needs, and the other thing is what Internet Society also wants to do. So our action plan is all the things in the upper layer, and there is more. This is a high level. Just to show you that we are totally emanate, all our actions emanate from the Internet Society 2019 action plan, and we hope that it will feed back into it, feed back into it and inform it. So at the end, uh, we're creating something that is truly global. The two policy aspects we will be engaging in next year are going to be uh, the enabling environment and the security of the internet infrastructure. 
So the research that we are doing again is going to look into, in the first case, is going to look into uh, how the legal, how regulations can impact positively or negatively the digital economy and basically the ability of internet to be used as a force for good, for employment, for all the good things that we know the internet to do. And the cybersecurity aligns with the building trust component in the improving technical securities, we're focusing on two aspects, routing security and IXPs. In collaborative approach, we'll be doing internet governance and IETF awareness. And next slide, please. This is a detailed uh, activity plan for those of you that would love to look at it later on. Next uh, next. Uh, so our summary takeaway for you, because we're anticipating good discussion now, is three things. So yes, it is a difficult region, but we do have a strategy. We're confident that we have a good strategy and only a collaborative approach will be used to implement this strategy. A top-down or one-way approach will not work in the region. Next slide, please. So the millennium in the team, Layan wants us, <laughs> makes us believe that we are all Yoda. We will do or not do, and we will not fail. We will, we will not even try. We will do we will not fail. And if you allow me, can we put the video, Kevin? So we're going to show you a sample of, this is the first draft. We haven't seen it yet. We know that uh, I saw some problems in the translation. It's the kind of things we're doing to promote this. This video will go viral in uh, very, very soon. And it's, <laughs> yes. Uh, and then uh, it will introduce, it's introducing internet society in the region. يستخدم الإنترنت يومياً أكثر من 160 مليون شخص من جميع أنحاء الشرق الأوسط يستخدمونه للتواصل مع الأصدقاء والأحباء للتجارة والعمل للتعلم والتنقل للفن واللعب كيف يعمل الإنترنت؟ ومن يديره؟ وهل لدينا كمستخدمين رأي في القرارات التي تحدد مستقبله؟ الإنترنت هيكلية لا مركزية معقدة تتكون من 64 ألف شبكة مستقلة تنتشر في جميع أنحاء العالم ويرتبط بعضها ببعض بواسطة أجهزة توجيه عبر كيلومترات من الكابلات الممتدة تحت الماء وعبر اليابسة النصوص والصور ومقاطع الفيديو وكل ما نتشاركه عبر الإنترنت يسافر عبر هذه الكابلات بسرعة الضوء كحزم بيانات ذات عناوين وأسماء فريدة من يدير الإنترنت؟ عدد كبير من الأشخاص يتألف المجتمع التقني من ألاف الأفراد المنتمين إلى مئات المنظمات التي تشرف على البنية التحتية للإنترنت وتتفق فيما بينها على معايير بروتوكولات الاتصال تتخذ هذه المنظمات قرارات بشأن السياسات التي تؤثر على تسجيل أسماء المواقع وأرقام الإنترنت وعناوين وبروتوكولات الاتصال وتجتمع سنويا بانتظام لمناقشة أفضل الممارسات في هندسة الشبكات ولحل التحديات الطارئة كالحوادث الأمنية التي تهدد الجوهر الإيجابي للإنترنت فالإنترنت مبني على أسس التعاون والمشاركة والابتكار الحر والتوافق تحديد مستقبل الإنترنت مسؤولية جماعية يمكن لكل فرد أن يساهم فيها فجمعية الإنترنت إنترنت سوسايتي ومنذ إنشائها قبل 25 عاما تجمع الناس من جميع أنحاء العالم لضمان مستقبل ينتفع فيه الجميع من خدمات الإنترنت المتصل والآمن والمتاح عالميا ومن خلال الانتساب إلى إنترنت سوسايتي يمكن لكل فرد أن يكون صوتا فاعلا في الجهد العالمي لحماية مستقبل الإنترنت ومصيره والمشاركة في قرارات سيكون لها الأثر الكبير على حياتنا في الحقبة المقبلة نعتمد جميعا على الإنترنت لبناء مستقبل أفضل بإمكانات لا حدود لها حان الوقت لأن نتولى المسؤولية انضموا إلى إنترنت سوسايتي هاشتاج شيب تمور <تصفيق> I've been jumping all day. <تصفيق> أول شيء أقول أنا سعيد جدا بهذه المبادرة. وأريد أسألكم سؤال ليش الدول العربية اللي هي فيها حروب فيها المشكلة الأكثر فيها النمو الأكثر؟ I just had to do it. 
Um, uh, so I guess the question is mine. I will translate in English in a minute. دول العربية اللي فيها مشاكل أكثر شيء عم بتكون الأولى الأولى بتشابترز لأنه عم بيكون في حاجة حاجة حقيقية ليغيروا عن جد وعم بيلاقوا مؤسسات مثلنا نحن هي الطريق ليقدروا يغيروا لأنه عم نقدر نساعدهم من خلال المشاركة معهم بالمجتمع اللي عم بيعملوه. So what Walid actually asked was why are the two chapters uh, the most uh, engaging and they are the highest tier? And as I mentioned, they are the war-torn countries. They find a very big need to change and to, to, to get out of the status quo. So they find us, uh, organizations like us, they find salvation maybe in, in, in contacting us and, and, and reaching out to us and then having us extend them to the world and in order to find solutions for them. Thank yeah, you. If I could add to that. So there was a summer school for internet governance that you saw the little thing in there that they were, um, the team organized in Cairo. And there were uh, a number of uh, youth from Yemen, and they were among the most engaged. And uh, notwithstanding the war-torn um, nature of Yemen at the moment, which you know better than any of us, um, they were also the most optimistic. Uh, and so this is a this this was a, a way for them to engage and actually look for optimism. And and I think it's probably the same same thing in Palestine. So it was it was a great. Meaning the question is from that the follow up for them, right? Um, and how they can engage. One of the things that um, came up there, and again, it's a question of follow up, was uh, there was a there was zero um, uh, visibility or or even you know, any any visibility or recognition of Beyond the Net when they heard about the Beyond the Net projects, um, the room just lit up and they said, how do they get involved? And so again, this is, I think, an example of things to make try and very pragmatic, um, making some of these things. So I have other questions later, but I just. So I'm going to start a queue. I have Hans Peter, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, so I have Hans Peter, Olga, Desiree, and Pepper. I Okay, I, I really liked your presentation and I liked the way you described your contact with governments and uh, with security cycles. And you often use the word we, and uh, that's wonderful. Uh, but I'm asking a little bit more clarification about what do you mean with we? How do you engage with chapters? How do you engage with org members in approaching governments and in approaching security cycles? Thanks for the question. It's a difficult question. <laughs> so, as Nermin pointed out, we have to work top down and bottom up at the same time. Uh, governments are not into the culture of talking to non government actors. In, there's no mandatory consultation, for example, in a lot of the Arabic countries. So, uh, even in the case where we have strong chapter, which is in war and torn countries, <laughs> even in the case that we have strong chapters, you will find that they do not have access to, to the government. We're working on this, right? So we're working on, on breaking this, the silos mentality that, okay, we only talk to people like, like ourselves. Whether it is in the civil society part or the private sector, or the government. We're trying to, to bridge that, if that answers your question. It, it's, not, it's not easy, yeah? Because you're going through uh, against a, a culture and a habit, right? But we are, yeah, we are doing it. <laughs> Thank you. I have this very old gap paper. Uh, Harry. Yes, I to echo. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I, the concern you raise about the lack of technical community in the region and uh, obviously addressing some of the network security issues. Uh, what are the plans to address this? This video is wonderful, very positive, but I, I just wonder if you're preparing any educational material uh, that would teach members about elements of security and, and privacy. Uh, again, thank you for the question. So. Uh, 
this uh, uh, video is the introduction. That's for the masses, for the youth. That is what you call them technically savvy, right? So for the youth who is technically savvy that we want to bring into the pipeline, right? Uh, hopefully, if that works as we want this year, if it goes viral, when it goes viral, we will turn our attention into the other material. But already we are working with Toral and her team. We have translated the internet governance course into Arabic. And we're trying to partner with IDRAC, which is a MOOC based in London that claims to have millions of, uh, of views in order to put our content with them so it has um, a higher um, um, visibility. And again, the next step would be what you're saying is have targeted uh, um, content for uh, technology. And here maybe um, Layal can help because in her old life she has a a an educational website or platform called Mubarmij that's only to put content, technical content in Arabic. And if I may uh, continue on what Salam has mentioned and take it to the second level or the upper level, Salam uh, concentrated on the youth and the youth savvy for technology and so on. And I will highlight for you that our action plan in 2019 will try, and I will just don't quote me on this because I know some will not be um, into that, but I'm trying or we are trying to bring the IETF to the region where the technical expertise, the professional experts will understand more about the technical issues. How are we going to do that? We're going to do some awareness workshop with some experts from the IETF on the different aspects of technology so that people can understand what is the IETF and that it, it exists in the first place because sometimes they don't know that IETF exists in the first place, unfortunately, in the region. So we will teach them that there is something called the IETF and then how they can benefit and of course, um, you know, like educate them on some of the technicalities that they really miss as per our knowledge of the region and the, the, the gathering of information that we are doing at, at the time being. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you, of course, know that this is a public meeting, so we are, you know, recording. So <laughs> people will be able to quote you on the, <laughs> <laughs> the point. <laughs> um, so I have this here. Are you okay? Any follow up? Okay, thank you. Um, Olga. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very, very interesting. And thank you, Salam, Narmin, and Layal. And I know Narmin for a long time. Uh, and uh, you're in very good hands. I know it's a very challenging region, and, and you're a new team, a new bureau. And uh, when you were mentioning the, the figures of the region, I, I felt that you were talking about Latin America because the, the similarities I were, and I knew that, that, that you really brought that to my mind again. So I, I'm, and I would like to perhaps offer you kind of bridging experiences from our region to yours, for example, about IXPs, you know, Argentina has been of the leading countries building IXPs. We are almost with a Beyond the Net project, almost installing with the chapter, the southern in the world, uh, IXP in, in Ushuaia, the southern city in the world. So um, we have a lot of experience. There's a language barrier, but I think that we can work easily on that. So count on us, on, on us if, we can, if we can help you in any way. Uh, the region has a lot of young people like you, a lot of problems with unemployment. Some countries have economic difficulties, some others are more developed. So uh, just let's try to build a bridge and exchange uh, experiences. And, and I commend you for your work. Thank you, Olga. Well received and will be followed. <laughs> I think I have managed to log myself out of Zoom or something. Um, Raul wanted to speak at some point, or okay. So Raul, yeah, I requested yeah, the floor. Okay, the... I will add you. I will add you to the queue. Then I have Pepper, Harry, yes, Richard, and Raul. Then Pepper, perfect. please. So um, again, uh, congratulations on putting together. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a new group. Um, Doing this very quickly and actually having a, an action plan. A um, couple of things. One, um, I do think that even though you know there is this sort of tendency towards top down, um, I think there's a real opportunity to maybe not bottom up from sideways in. Think of it a different way. Uh, one of the big issues that you identified was the lack of um, content in Arabic. 
right? And so let me, you know that working with UI, you and I had done previously was working um, with a lot of the media companies, the content companies, the online companies. There's a lot going on in the region to create Arabic internet content. Uh, in the Levant, a lot of it's based in um, Lebanon. Um, you know, Egypt has always been the hub of media for the Arab speaking world. Um, so I think there's an opportunity on that in particular to reach out to on the, 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 if they're not, I bet, currently organizational members of ISOC, but they should be, they could be, and I think it would benefit, there'd be a mutual benefit, and it's coming in sideways to, uh, to solve a real, real problem, which is the lack of really great Arabic online content, which, and that will help the engagements at the top of government because it's helping government solve problems about creating a lot of good positive content. So I think that would actually be a useful thing to add to the strategy. Um, the, the Going to the question on um, how do you engage, this goes to both Desiree's question and the other governments, um, especially on some of the technical issues. Unlike other parts of the world, almost all of the government officials um, are engineers, right? In fact, you know, it's when you speak to government officials in parts of the region, um, they'd much rather be addressed as engineer somebody as opposed to minister somebody. So being an engineer is actually way more important in the, these countries than being a government official. So I think, and now, unfortunately, most of them, very few are computer, Science engine, you know, it's a computer science background. Most of them come from telecom engineering, but nevertheless, those two things we meet. I think that's, again, a entry point for a conversation. These, they are engineers, they're technically minded. I think there's a way to link this back with IETF and the technical community in a very constructive way um, by having people come from internet society who are technical to have technical conversations, right? And you'll see people's faces light up, you know this. Third is um, the, some of the, again, the partnering. And again, I just have no idea. Again, so I'm, you were involved, Richard. Um, you, you are at, at, at Cisco, you know, working with um, not just Cisco, Net Academies. I mean, there are things that can be done linking. There's Microsoft, I mean, a lot of the companies have these kinds of training, again, on the technical side, uh, that there may be a way to link with, the, with you and ISOC to leverage existing members that are not necessarily based in the region, but again, trying to solve some of the, the in a very pragmatic, concrete way. Um, so those are just some ideas. Thank you. They're all well taken, and yes, we will include them. It's good points. Thank you, Pepper. I have Harish next. Um, thank you. Excellent presentation. And I'm glad to see straight to the point and got some you know, high impact uh, points in there. Uh, I'm you know, coming from a different angle. Uh, have you engaged with the open source developer community in that region? Uh, because there are, I know of a lot of them in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, in uh, uh, in Jordan, um, in uh, in Yemen, I think there's there's a few. I, I don't have the names off the top of my head. At Oman, and in, uh, in those 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 countries, right? So there are there is a community there. There are a lot of open source developers who could potentially be you know uh, uh, people whom you can reach out to. In fact, I just tweeted out uh, asking for anyone from there to contact me directly. So that I can connect you with them, uh, because I think that is important to recognize people on the ground there as well. So, uh, you know, happy to help wherever we can. Thank you. Um, thank you for that note. We appreciate the help, of course, and we reach out. Um, we did uh, so part of our Middle East plan for 2019, uh, which is in the presentation. We are creating these courses uh, with SMEs and workshops with uh, universities and. Uh, 
of the community in general, dividing the capabilities and what type of workshop they're getting. Uh, part of which will definitely be the open source community. Uh, I personally have good connections with them. I'm part of the open source uh, developers community in Lebanon and the Docker community. Um, so they are taken into uh, consideration. We're also partnering with entities like uh, we have ongoing talks with Omnia to partner with the think tanks, the accelerators, the incubators. So it's everyone. We're bringing everyone on board because we want everyone to know about the trans society and be engaged. Thank you. Um, Richard is next. Well, the reach kind of stole the report, so I was going to talk about open source as well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, James, James provided me with a copy of this report. You guys mentioned it. I, I just went through it. It looks really, really good. Um, and, and I appreciate you getting You guys are really, seem really focused on concrete issues that, that un, people understand and how to speak. So, like, big kudos on that. Thanks for doing that. One of the things I thought was that was especially uh, nice to me about that was the focus on startup culture and the, the difference that these internet enabled startups are making in the economy here. Um, and I think it's kind of tied to this, um, the point that Harish made about open source, kind of building that technical community to uh, encourage people to, to feel comfortable taking the risks and building things, you know, just kind of starting off in the, the technical unknown that you need to do when you're doing these you know, startups. Um, so this is all just by way of saying, saying like plus one to Harish and plus one to what we're you guys are doing. Um, I think another aspect of the open source thing is that can be a, a, another way to bring money into the region. Although of course, a lot of open source grant making programs and a lot of uh, the private sector folks interested in funding open source. And um, in my experience, uh, serving on some of those boards, making grants, like we are always super excited to see applications for open source uh, grant work from outside of the kind of you know, traditional Silicon Valley, Western Europe channels because we know there are different needs in those regions and it's important to get software and, and you know, technical systems built to meet those needs. And so it, I think there's their, their latent funding interest in those uh, domains as well. So the, I think there's, there's a community ready to support those efforts if you can, you can kind of make the matches. Mm -hmm. Th thanks for this. Um, yes, we will uh, really engage the for the open uh, source community and the hackers community, and believe it or not, it also exists. You know, we uh, ethical hackers, I might, I might say. Uh, we also then have to be a little bit more creative about the kind of activities we do because these people will not come to to be in a workshop about, say, I don't know, internet governance or you know. So we have to be, you know, maybe we can think together about the content also that we can provide that they, that will attract these people. For the digital economy, it's also um, very important what you said because the region really, there's a big, big, big bubble about entrepreneurship because as, as my colleague Noreen said, we have the highest unemployment rate in the world for, for young people. 40 million jobs have to be created per year. Nobody's gonna be able to do this. For sure, governments alone will not be able to do this and they are aware of that because of the sheer number of the, the pyramid of age in the, in the, in the, in the region. And they're asking the question, why? We have the money, we have educated people. Why is it that we only have soup.com? Why don't we have only one unicorn, right? So, and this ties back into this enabling environment on the digital economy paper research that we're gonna do. is because we have to also show them that it's not only the availability of money and, and, and resources. You know, look, the regulatory environment, all together, we need to research that together with them. This is going to affect also the fact that you are going to create a unicorn on it. And, and I think this is the, the differentiator between, say, Silicon Valley and the one of the main differentiators between Silicon Valley and Earth is that regulatory environment. Yeah, I think you guys are at a really interesting intersectional point in terms of having a bunch of capability that's right on that, that's right on that inflection point and just needs a certain, a certain specific set of changes to figure things out and, and unlock that. Um, Please take good notes because I think there's an opportunity here to learn a lot of stuff that could be translated to other parts of the world. Thank you. I have um, uh, Walid and then Raoul. I mean, I'd like to add on to the note about creativity. <laughs> we can't really survive much without creativity in the Middle East. And that sometimes you do things on the surface that may appear on being one thing, but in reality, you're actually aiming at doing and achieving something else. Uh, the good example is blockchain technology. I don't think that 
it would be uh, many developers coming out from there at, at this instant. But the idea was, in fact, making sure that they learn about something new and they we use the momentum to bring in more people and get them engaged in the internet society. Uh, and in addition to that, of course, open source programming and all sorts of things that come along Side the aspect of new, new emerging technologies. So uh, among the participants that I've had the pleasure of meeting were a couple that actually were into coding and they ended up maintaining contact. And so now I propose that they reach out to the ITF and apply for, uh, for uh, from, from a fellowship and maybe be a voice from the region. So these are opportunities. What I like to emphasize though is the need for having a direct contact with the technical community members. And this is something missing, I see uh, a lot. I, I find that Asren, uh, my good Yusuf, uh, Yusuf friend, Yusuf Roman, is a, a strong voice, but he's, I think he's the only one working in this domain. So maybe focusing more on academia, on research. And I, as a researcher, I understand that it's research that started all the whole thing called the internet today. So we try to reach out to those elements and bring them over. Thank you and welcome. Okay, thank you. Then uh, Raul, please. Uh, thank you, Gonzalo. Um, um, I have to say that I'm very proud of this team. This is the, the youngest bureau in the organization. And um, by the way, thank you very much, uh, Walid, for your permanent support uh, since the inception of the, of, of the bureau, even before uh, hiring Salam. And, this is a, uh, is, is a, is a symbolic thing that uh, that speak very well about this organization that we have we have only one uh, woman as a regional director and is the is the leader of the most challenging region in terms of uh, gender um, and equality. So the is a, uh, and by coincidence we have a team of women now <laughs> in, in Middle East. But it's just, it was not on purpose, it's because we hire the best people for each of the shops that, that we are uh, hiring. And this is, I have learned a lot about Middle East uh, working with Salam. And the, the first uh, thing that uh, we realized when we tried to form this bureau, and this is why I relied very much on Walid, is that, is that we understood that we didn't know anything about Middle East. Uh, so the so the first thing that we wanted to do was to learn about the region, and I have learned a lot. Um, this organization is undoubtedly a much more in diverse and international organization than a few years ago, and this is also a challenge because it's, it's not something that we can just uh, stop to celebrate, saying, "Oh, how diverse we are! Uh, we have people in almost thirty countries. We have six uh, regional bureaus." And, it's a it's a challenge because uh, once that we become more diverse, it's, we have the challenge to speak in the same language in the language that is appropriate for uh, every different places. When I say language, I'm not speaking about about the, about the 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 language itself. I'm speaking about the culture. How we use a, a language that is uh, is appropriate uh, for each of the regions, each of the countries. Uh, this is a something that this bureau is contributing very much internally to the organization too. But uh, we, are, we are learning about how to work with the, in, in, this, uh, in this region. I'm very proud of the work that, that the team has done. It was a team of uh, one person um, almost uh, for two years. And now the, we have a, a very good talent in the team and we plan to continue strengthening the team. We, have, we are opening other positions, uh, technical engagement position and a policy uh, and a communication position next year. So then uh, I'm very enthusiastic that uh, we will continue uh, achieving great things in, in, in Middle East. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Raul. Um, I don't have anyone in the queue. Any further comments? Yes. So I wanted to say something that even though we're, um, uh, well, uh, we mentioned the MOUs for the chapters a bit ago, 
uh, there's also another challenge that we face in our region specifically. It is uh, creating uh, chapters. It takes up to six years, for example, to create an NGO in Oman. So these are one of the major challenges uh, that I wanted to, uh, to mention. I was hoping someone would ask me about it, then I'm going to mention it anyways. Uh, for example, Lebanon is very easy to set up uh, an NGO. It was the easiest. Uh, Jordan, it's been taking us for the, uh, I've been with you guys for five months and something. It's been taking us that much to just get the people on board and get the papers ready. Oman is six years, UAE is nearly impossible. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that it's, it's challenging. Yeah, it's very difficult to set up an NGO in the term that you know it, you know, in the developed world in the Arab region. And this affects also um, the good standing of our chapters and the way we communicate with them. We, we, we're trying to try, as well you said, creative solutions, <laughs> working with the other, uh, with Joyce and the rest of the team on this, but I mean, it is still a, um, a, ja a challenge. Um, Harish, uh, I guess I'm not understanding what you meant, uh, creating an NGO. Are you talking about the chapters that are established will be labeled as an NGO? So, so they need a society that is set up in the, within the country's uh, legal system? Yeah. They, maybe maybe so, uh, Andrew, Andrew yeah. can take that. Yeah, part of uh, being a chapter, they have to be legal entities. And uh, so the, the current structure, um, we're, we're requiring um, legal entities. And, um, and, and this is not the only region where this is sometimes a challenge, right? Because what happens is people have to set up a legal entity. They can be very difficult. We've had some problems in, uh, in the LAC region as well for similar reason. Because frequently uh, what happens is it's easy to set up some kind of legal entity, but it's always a for-profit um, arrangement. And you can't set up nonprofits um, easily or in some cases at all. Uh, so the UAE, for instance, basically doesn't have a nonprofit law. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, then it becomes a, a serious problem because we, we can't transfer, I, I mean, you know, then we have a, a jurisdictional problem because we can't transfer money to for-profit entities, um, tr kind of trivially. It becomes actually a very serious problem for us because of IRS regulations. And so the, the interaction of all of these things, um, becomes part of the issue. I think the, maybe one of the long-term things we're going to have to look at is, is how we can, you know, think of other ways to do that. I don't think that's a today um, project because um, it would be a long, complicated thing. It would affect um, the internet society's own, um, uh, own legal status. And so we have to be very careful about that. So it's not one of the current hot priorities, uh, but it, it might be one of the things that we have to think about over the somewhat longer term. Yeah, thinking that longer view, it seems like there, there could be some policy advocacy opportunities here. It's not, Directly internet related, but it seems like it could be broadly beneficial for people trying to make the most out of these projects. Uh, yeah, but I think this goes back to the, the point that, um, and, and again, this is something that is shared in some other, in other some other regions, right? Um, there are, I know it will astonish you to learn that there are governments in the world who like it that the, um, there are no um, advocacy um, organizations that are you know within the country and so on, and uh, and that is. Uh, uh, you know, so you're, this goes back, I think, to, to uh, what um, uh, everyone, but I, I think especially Ramin was saying about, uh, you know, having a, a sort of cultural um, sensitivity to the fact that we're working in a, in a culture that is to, um, you know, perhaps to a North American perspective, extraordinarily different. Uh, and, um, and that is, you know, one of the difficulties that, um, that we're faced with. I had, in fact, there was a photograph in the presentation of me getting um, quite a talking to about um, a failing society in which I live. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I don't think that this is, um, uh, I, I don't think this is a one-way problem, right? That, that everybody in the world brings to uh, any of these kinds of intercultural exchanges uh, preconceptions about the way other people live. And uh, I think that one of the reasons that we have regional bureaus is precisely so that we can bring the perspective, the local perspective, um, you know, to bear on, on, on the situation there. That's also the reason to try to develop, uh, you know, chapters and try to develop other kinds of relationships there. 
Uh, but to to go back to something that was in an earlier session, right? The, the chapters, um, the chapter AC, for instance, was saying, well, we got to get everybody to join the chapter. Well, there are going to be some parts in the world where that that ain't going to be a possibility. And we're going to have to deal with people in a much more informal and less structured way, and that's okay. We're the internet society. We've got lots of different ways to be a society, and um, this is one way that we can uh, we can figure out how to do it. The you know the internet didn't grow with a monolithic picture, and we don't have to have a monolithic answer to every um, to everything that we do in every part of the world. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was trying to play this clip. I don't know if it would work. So that was Master Yoda, actually, um, in the the quote you guys were using. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, just just to say that I mean I really like that kind of you know quote and um, and you know this way of of working and I mean like the only person in the whole organization we don't want to get you know too creative is Sandy. Anyone else? You know, <laughs> we want to, you know, we don't do creative accounting, <laughs> but everyone else, you know, we really appreciate, you know, just, yes, you know, go, going around obstacles, you know, finding new ways to, to get things done. So I, I think that was a greatly appreciated. We, just one second. When, when I, I, I put you on the queue. Regarding the, the, I mean, structure of the presentation, I, I was discussing with, with Andrew beforehand, and I, I think it worked out very well. To have a you know to the point crisp presentation just you know very clear about you know what you guys are doing accomplishments how you are measuring things and then leaving plenty of time for um q a i think that work is that everyone's kind of view okay so i think in for future presentations we will we will follow that so thanks a lot for putting that together in in such a good way i think that was um very um, useful. Um, so now we have like one minute. So I'm going to give the floor to Harris and Walid, but please be brief. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about creative uh, uh, ideas, maybe is it possible for you to work with the universities uh, in their IT club or, or society within the university to become the ISOC chapter there? And then they then can be, because they already have an existing infrastructure, so that moves it forward without having a separate on, uh, entity. Thank you, Harris. Well, it. I've raised this before, and I'll raise it again. When will the board meet in the Middle East? And that's <laughs> and that's a question I'm interested to know. Uh, how do you feel uh, in terms of having some form of uh, meeting there? Yeah. So yeah. Well, two things before I, I address that. Like, there's actually currently a proposal to to for the IETF to maybe go. To, to that region, so we are working on that and looking into that, so it may or may not happen. We invite the IETF actually to Upper Egypt, Aswan in specific, where we can have right. like a dedicated Nile cruise for the IETF, where we can blend the historical monuments of the Egyptian culture yeah. with the new technology trends, and this is why we can leapfrog from this. Yeah. This, this uh, I mean, a process for that, that I, I myself, in my day job, work on hosting IETF meetings as well, and, and it's not trivial to bring it to a location, I can tell you. So, I mean, re realistically, even when you are a host and you put the money, there's, I mean, a process that you have to follow, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, Nermin put together an IGF, yeah. among other stuff, so. No, to be clear, you don't need to convince me. It's, it's, <laughs> this, if it was up to me, things would be different, but, but <laughs> exactly, yeah, it's, it's not up to me, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, just to say that, you know, there's a process for that. So we will work with you guys to understand, you know, I mean, how, how to put together a proposal, basically. This is, this is how it goes. And, and there's a lot of aspects, you know, one is, of course, you know, to have host. Another one is to have an attractive meeting. The, the main one is, is so that people can get their job done. So, you know, like meeting facilities, etc. So just to say that, I mean, Andrew is very much aware of the process. I am, I mean, several people here. So we can talk to you and, and take it from there. And then the second point that Walid was making is that we've been indeed discussing, you know, to, to bring a, a board meeting to, um, to the region. And we discussed, at least as far as I can tell, the last two years. So, so I think that, you know, this is um, something that basically it's, I mean, yeah, Walid was asking me, what's my opinion? Again, it's, it's not so important what's my opinion. It's, it's you know, we, we decide with, yeah, within the board, exactly. So, so this is something that we discuss at every AGM. And uh, and last year we were, for example, discussing. 
Yeah, true. We, we, we have been in particular discussing Beirut, Dubai. So, you know, we'll see if, if something could, could happen. Uh, after this, consider yourselves officially invited. So if it makes it easier to decide now. Yeah, absolutely. We decided the AGM, but, you know, it's, it's good to, to understand, you know, the possibilities. And, and while it is always pushing us in that direction, which we are. Yeah, maybe, maybe a Yemen meeting. Okay, so thanks a lot again, um, and thanks everyone on, online as well, and Raul for the comments and everything. So now we're gonna break one hour for lunch, and you know, I would like to invite all of you in the room for, for lunch. So the lunch is gonna be served across the hall, and you can leave all your you know, laptops and everything here. I think Kevin will set like, you know, the two snipers as usual too, so that nobody um, enters the room. And so for remote, Participants, we are breaking for one hour. We'll be back in, in roughly one hour. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Are we ready to go back online? Okay, perfect. So, okay, we are back from lunch. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. I don't know if we have remote participants at this point. Um, but anyway, for, for people here in the room, we're gonna have um, James present the, the the update on intercommunity and then we will have a very small break so that you know people can vacate the room and then we will continue the whole um, afternoon in executive session so this is going to be the last open open item in in the in today's agenda so james um yeah we have allocated 20 minutes so please go ahead okay thank you gonzalo thank you everybody so, um, yes, the purpose of this presentation is to provide you with uh, a report on preparations for uh, this year's intercommunity event. Um, of course, intercommunity as a concept still hinges on the idea of uh, strengthening our ties with our community and making uh, sure that our community feels connected with our work so that you know, we can all march forward together uh, in pursuit of our, our mission. Um, it's been a constant fixture now since 2015. Uh, we've had an intercommunity every year. Um, but uh, I don't feel as though we should feel constrained by what we've done in the past. And in fact, um, plans this year, as you know, have been shifting a little bit. And I think it's good for us to remain agile and to change the plan if we feel as though that's, that's needed. And indeed, we have. So since uh, we provided you with an update on the intercommunity in Panama back in June, <clears throat> we've shifted the plans uh, again and we've, we've had another look at uh, what is appropriate for us to do. What we realized was that our plans at that point were perhaps overly ambitious um, and we had a lot on the calendar, especially in Q4, and we're actually right in the midst of a lot of things going on. Uh, we've talked about some of that today in terms of um, Century, IGF coming up, Peace Forum. Uh, so a lot of work on, on our plate, but we also realized uh, that there was a lot of um, events and agenda items on the community's plate too, and that they probably wouldn't have the bandwidth to support what we were suggesting and asking of them in the original plans for intercommunity. So we've taken another look, uh, and the idea now is to scale back, uh, and also to use this as a moment to set uh, something of a new direction for intercommunity for, for future years. Most importantly, uh, we want to use this year's intercommunity as a moment to take a, 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 a step back from the process and to ask our community and to fully understand from them what it is that they would like to see in a community-focused and community-centric event uh, that the Internet Society runs on a global basis. So it's really a moment to, to, uh, that provides us with an opportunity to hear from our community and understand from them what it is that they would like. Okay. So we've simplified the approach. That's the bottom line. Um, this year, we're just proposing two sessions, uh, which we've conceived of as online webinars, uh, more or less. So two online sessions uh, at two fixed points um, in the day on December the 24th. So one uh, in the morning, uh, sorry, just December the 4th. Did I try to say 24th? I'm thinking of Christmas already. Um, yeah. So one in the morning UTC, uh, which would be more for European uh, Asia time zone, so everything from sort of London uh, eastwards, and then one later on in the day UTC for the Americas. Um, three weeks back, we put out a call for uh, 
registration uh, and uh, Dan actually gave me the updated figure a little bit earlier on. We've got, I believe it's 451 uh, people registered right now. Uh, and from uh, next week, we're gonna be pushing out uh, further calls for registration and, and promoting the Inter community further. So that's not a bad start. We've still got a, a number of weeks to run, um, but of course, um, we'll, we'll do our utmost to promote that. Um, so uh, what's involved? If you move on to the next slide. Um, not only have we simplified the format in terms of running two live streams or webinars on December the 4th, but we've also really simplified the agenda. So it comprises three principal components. First is uh, a presentation of the action plan, uh, which uh, we hope we'll be able to share with our community following this board meeting so that they would have time to read it and digest it and absorb it um, between now and December the 4th. The second main component is really the heart of intercommunity, as I've explained, to begin the, the conversation and the consultation process with our community to understand what it is that they would like to see from a, a global community event. And then thirdly, uh, the culmination of our Chapter Thon 2018 project where uh, we highlight the three uh, projects with the, with the, with the most votes, uh, if you like, or the most um, support from the community, and of course the winner of the, of the Chapter Thon for this year. There are some uh, trustee or potential trustee, board of trustee roles peppered throughout that agenda as well, and I can touch on those as I, as I go through the next few slides. There is a further component uh, beyond those two, three, uh, those three um, agenda items, and that is uh, uh, the technology component. Um, we've heard a, a lot this morning uh, through our discussions about the, the organizational member, um, and how that work is changing, plus our engagement with our chapters. And of course, engagement is, is key to our success as an organization, and it's certainly key to our continued uh, relationship uh, with, our, with our community. So we wanted to find a way to build um, engagement into intercommunity itself. And of course, there's technology out there that can help us do that. So um, we're going to use uh, this tool, which is called Slido, uh, to facilitate the conversation, to make it more interactive, to make sure that we can actually uh, hear uh, what our community think in real time and in advance of intercommunity. So the, the advantage with this is that we can begin the conversation before we get to the event itself. Uh, we can take questions, we can get input, and we can use some of that uh, during uh, the December the 4th event. Um, a lot of what we want to do here is to begin the listening process uh, throughout the course of the next year. So uh, this, particular uh, technology will, will help us do that. We have done some due diligence. Uh, our IT team has been assessing this platform, this technology. Uh, I don't believe they have any concerns with it from a privacy perspective. Um, and there are very low barriers to entry for our community around the world to use it. It should be uh, simple, simple for everyone to use. Uh, so we're gonna give it a try and uh, hopefully it will facilitate the conversation and help to drive it forward. FYI, we, we use, we use Slido at, at MOG meetings. <clears throat> the good news is technically it's great, it works wonderfully. The bad news is that nobody used it and we couldn't figure out why not. So I'll be interested to see if your experience is different. Okay, well that's a good one to know. So we'll, we'll let you know if we have any more success. Yeah, so we'll obviously be promoting use of that, of that tool as we promote it. Um, so the next few slides, uh, Kevin, if you advance one, uh, really just sort of break down that agenda in a little bit more detail to give you the granular view of, of what we're talking about. So um, time will be tight. I think it's safe to say that. We're looking at uh, each of these two uh, sessions, these webinar sessions, uh, as running at 90 minutes each. Uh, no more than that. I think in the past, uh, some of our inter-community events have been longer, and uh, we've definitely noticed um, that that is not the ideal recipe. Um, so we're, we're condensing um, the session into 90 minutes only. There'll be a, approximately 10 minutes of introduction, uh, and that's what you see on this slide. Um, so some pre-show warm-up, if you like, and then a welcome message. We're proposing Andrew just delivers a quick welcome message at the beginning, and then our um, Master of Ceremonies uh, will take over to do a little bit of housekeeping. Many of you will know Evelyn Namara, who's uh, our Global Community Engagement Manager, based in Uganda.
the, and she will be the MC for uh, this winter community. I think she's perfectly placed for that um, that role. She's uh, she's a networker herself. She's a prominent figure in the community, um, and I think uh, uh, you know we regard her as a, a very active Internet Society community member. To be honest, um, she'll also run through how to use the tool for the, the Slido tool for those people on the call. Um, and then there's potential for either uh, Gonzalo or Andrew, perhaps, or depending on what we want to do there, to transition to the first key agenda item, which of course uh, on the next slide is the action plan. The idea here is for Andrew to provide a very condensed uh, presentation of the action plan in a, in a sort of short window of eight minutes or so, um, trying to keep to time. Um, but to open up Slido at that point for input, for questions, for a little bit of feedback, we can ask things like, you know, have you read the plan in advance of intercommunity, just to get a sense of how many people on the call have taken the time to, to read it. We can ask them whether they have any specific feedback, what aspects of the plan are most appropriate or relevant for their region, for example. Um, so we'll be capturing questions through the Slido tool throughout the presentation that Andrew gives. And then we'll use those questions to um, inform our discussion where the audience and the participants actually have the option to uh, upvote, we've invented our own verb there, I think, um, upvote the questions that they would like answered uh, as part of intercommunity. So they'll have an, uh, an opportunity to select the questions that they think are most interesting. And then of course the uh, exec team uh, who will be on the call uh, will be able to field some of those questions and will be able to share them around uh, as, as appropriate. So all of that uh, will last approximately 30 minutes. So there'll be a the third of the, the call will be on or around the action plan, more or less. Um, there is a potential board role as well here, which uh, uh, is, is um, a possibility for us. I mean, if there is any interest, uh, we might have some board members um, introduce some of those questions, uh, help to sort of uh, manage the flow of questions there uh, and allocate them and distribute them around. Moving on, um, we then come to, uh, I guess the, the heart of the, uh, this year's intercommunity in terms of the idea of opening up the conversation about what future intercommunity events could look like. Uh, we'll run a little teaser for the next item, the Chapter Thorn project, just before we get to that. Um, but this part of the program will be run by both myself and Joyce, who of course is, has been very involved in the, in the chapter on and who is uh, our sort of prime person for community engagement. And we'll ask for new ideas during this session um, so that the people and participants can uh, propose some thinking, propose some new ideas, and again we'll ask participants to upvote whichever ones they think are, uh, are interesting and use that as the basis for conversation. So it really is all about uh, starting the conversation and the consultation process with the community that will follow through into next year about um, how, what they would like to see in, a, in future events like this. And then of course we get to the third component, our chapter thon, um, where you move on one, Kevin. So where Ilda, who um, is very involved in that, and Christine will provide an overview of the project. Uh, and just to recap, for those here, um, the, uh, the, the premise of um, ch the chapter from this year was for the community to identify an Internet of Things project of some kind, and then to develop uh, a plan according to um, a couple of criteria points, namely uh, that the project uh, would be uh, funded by a $2,000 budget or within a $2,000 budget and take 45 days to, to implement. Um, and thirdly, then to create a video of, about the project that they put together. So 43 chapters um, participated in the chapter fund this year. Uh, a note went out to the community yesterday uh, to say that uh, voting had begun on that. So by the time we get to the uh, inter-community event, we will have selected three, the top three uh, projects and we'll be able to highlight that during the inter-community uh, and again, use Slido to get a sense from the participants uh, on the call about what they like in those three projects. So that's again another potential discussion point. Um, and there's a potential board role there again to introduce those top three videos, the videos being part of the projects that the chapters put together. 
And then uh, beyond that, uh, of course, there is the moment at which we announce the winner, and there's certainly a, a trustee role there if anyone is interested in, in having that. Um, very good visibility for, for all of the community to see a trustee uh, having, that, having that, that role. This final slot then, um, if you go to the next slide, Helen, we were just addressing that. Yeah, runs for around 10 minutes, the award of the chapter, chapter Thon prize, and then a five minute closing, and that will essentially wrap up um, into community for this year. And that's really all there is to it, to be honest. I think um, perhaps there's a, a conversation to have with anyone who may be interested in, in taking any of those board roles uh, that we could take offline. Um, come and talk to me if you, if you are interested and we can work out the details um, so that we're all ready to go on December the 4th. Any questions? I have Sean and then Richard. <clears throat> So a quick question about the videos um, that they're going to make, just to make sure it's like a level playing field, are we going to have, if English isn't their native language, are we going to have support for them to make sure that it's all kind of... Yeah, so we'll, we'll obviously get the videos in advance. We have them in advance. So we'll be able to add subtitles and make sure they're accessible and we'll do all of that work in advance. Yeah, yeah I'm uh, So just wondering what the kind of... Um, strategy is for getting people engaged and kind of gathering a group of participants for these events. Because I think that we've got some natural uh, channels and things to the chapters for this. I think I feel like this is kind of the, the natural thing, especially given the, the kind of chapter on focus. But this, this also seems like a useful event to get people to from uh, the org member community and the ITF community and you know, the, the broader internet community as well. I think that's a very good point. I mean, um, there is, I think, a need for cross-pollination across our channels and so that we're, we're not just going to our known community about the community event, it's also making sure that we reach out to uh, other um, you know, community groups, including OMAC and others, to make sure they're aware of this. Uh, so I think the big push around into community now will follow this meeting um, and we'll make sure that we're basically distributing information across the channels and making sure that everyone gets the message. Yeah, and just to, just to emphasize the point, I think this agenda in particular that you've laid out is really fairly amenable to someone who hasn't been involved with myself in the past, right? We're yeah. presenting what our plans are for the future. It's, 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 it's a good point for people who haven't been engaged to become now become engaged. Exactly. It's not issues based as it has been in the past. I have Glenn next and then Olga. Yeah. Um, do you have any metrics on the, the success of previous? Uh, communities and what what's your expectations for um, this year's performance so so we do have some metrics um, I can't remember them off hand but yeah, I think it's fair to say that the ROI on into community hasn't been great so quite con you know considerable amount of staff time and effort involved in pulling previous into communities together not least the, the time that the community has taken in many instances to pull together the nodes uh, get themselves organized, um, think about what they're going to present, um, an awful lot of effort. And to be honest, I think the, the payoff in terms of attendance and numbers in the past has been disappointing. You know, so we are going, we are using this as a reset. And to your point, Richard, you know, it is a, it is a more accessible agenda. And we're hoping that because of that, or partly because of that, we get more people involved. Uh, and more people feel as though uh, they, they can join and benefit from, from this. So, yeah, but we want, we'll want to measure our success here very closely as well, because it will be the baseline against which we measure what we do next year and beyond. So it's an opportunity to set that baseline too. Good, Olga. Thank you, James. I agree with the idea that it's more compressed and more focused. Um, some concerns about language, for example, when it's, towards the Americas, we have mainly Spanish, Portuguese, and English, and other languages as well. It will be only held in English, or there will be some translation. And just to remember, those translation online tools that we used in the, in the one in 2017, don't use that again, because it was very, very bad. And uh, um, as, as I think Richard said, it, it's mainly chapter involvement and, you know, 
but we should do an effort to involve the organization members as well, and uh, especially with some regional focus. Yeah, so, so we do want to make these events accessible to as many people as possible. So translation is, is, is key. I know that uh, Evelyn and crew had a technical call yesterday uh, in the early hours of this morning. So I don't know what was, came out of that quite yet, but uh, I know that translation and having um, you know, simultaneous translation was, was an, a topic for discussion. So it's certainly something that we want to build into this if at all possible. Yeah, yeah. I see Walid and yeah. Um, a question about timing. Uh, we did uh, our own survey about the forum and realized that there was weekends that were the most convenient for people to join an activity like this. Since this is on a Tuesday, I mean, would you think that would affect things? We looked at uh, what is what is happening in the in the community in terms of the events that we know about that many people are involved in. We also looked at our own calendar. It seemed like this was a good moment, but I think, again, it's a, it's a question we can perhaps uh, pose to the community and Slido maybe gives us a way to do that in terms of uh, whether, whether they would prefer to do something like this or whether the majority view is to do something like this on a weekend as you've found out or, or not. So I think um, we've, this is what we've, picked for now, um, but you know, we don't have to stick with that if we get different feedback. Good. Any, any other question for James? Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much, James. And uh, yeah, please keep us updated and coordinate offline if you need you know, trustees to do anything or perform any role and the same thing. I mean, please reach out to James if, if you are interested in anything particular. Thank you, James. Thanks a lot. Okay, good. So that brings us to the end of the open session for today. So, you know, for, for people on, online and for, for people here, we're going to start tomorrow. Let me check. I think it's at 10 past 10, but let me clarify. Is, is it? It's, uh, sorry. I think we are starting tomorrow in, no, I mean, no, not for yes. you trustees. The open session begins at 10, 10 a.m. Yes, Bangkok 10. time. Okay, so the open session we will become, begin to tomorrow at 10 past 10, and, uh, and we will be in closed session until then, this evening and, and tomorrow in the morning. So now we're going to break for like, you know, five, 10 minutes until people can leave the room, and then we will continue in the next session. Thank you.